morning and welcome. Uh, I would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you are not speaking. Uh, for media and press, the FDA press contact is Chanapa Tatiban Chachai. Her email and phone number are currently displayed. Um, they're not currently displayed on my screen. There it is. Um, my name is David O, and I will be chairing this meeting. I will now call the November 8, 2022 Pulmonary Allergy Drug Advisory Committee meeting to order. Dr. Takia Stevenson is the designated federal officer for this meeting, and we'll begin with the introductions. Good morning. My name is Takia Stevenson, and I am the designated federal officer for this meeting. All voting members have confirmed via email that they have viewed the pre-recorded presentations for today's meeting in their entirety. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation, and I confirm. Dr. Al? Hi, I'm David O. I am from the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System and the University of Washington, and I confirm. Dr. Carlson? Hi, I'm Don Carlson. I'm an industry representative, and I confirm. Dr. Evans? This is Scott Evans. I'm a pulmonologist at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, and I confirm that I have watched the videos. Dr. Holgan? Fernando Holguin, University of Colorado, and I confirm. Dr. Kim? Edwin Kim, allergist immunologist at the University of North Carolina. I confirm. Dr. May? Suzanne May, Professor of Biostatistics and Director of the Clinical Trials Center at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I confirm. Dr. Tracy? Uh, Dr. James Tracy, Clinical Professor of Pediatrics, University of Nebraska, in private practice, and I also confirm. Dr. Cabana? Good morning. This is Michael Cabana. I'm a general pediatrician. I'm physician-in-chief at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore and chair of pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. I confirm that I've read the documents and seen the video. Dr. Cataletto? Mary Cataletto, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist at NYU Long Island, and I confirm that I watched the videos. Dr. Cloutier? I'm Michelle Cloutier. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist at the Yukon School of Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut, and I confirm. Dr. Dykowitz? Hi, Mark Dykowitz, uh, Allergy and Immunology at St. Louis University School of Medicine, and I confirm that I've watched the presentations in their entirety. Dr. Greenberger? Paul Greenberger, Department of Medicine, Division of Allergy Immunology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, and I confirm. Thank you. Dr. Hunsberger? Sally Hunsberger, Biostatistics Research Branch, my ad, and I confirm that I have viewed the presentations. Dr. Jones? Dr. Bridget Jones, Professor of Pediatrics at University of Missouri, Kansas City, and Allergy Immunology and Pediatric Clinical Pharmacology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, and I confirm. Dr. Kaiser? Alex Kaiser, Assistant Professor of Biostatistics and Informatics at the University of Colorado, and I confirm that I have read the material and seen the video. Dr. Oster, or Ms. Oster? Yes. This is Randy Aster. I am the president of Help Me Health, and I confirm that I have uh, read and viewed the videos in entirety. Ms. Schwarzat? Hi, this is Jennifer Schwarzat. I am the patient representative, and I confirm. Dr. Stoller? 
Yes, this is Jamie Stoller. I'm a pulmonary doctor at the Cleveland Clinic, and I confirm. Thank you, panel members, for confirming. I will now continue to introducing the FDA participant, Dr. Seymour. Good morning. My name is Sally Seymour. I'm the director of the Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care in the Office of New Drugs at the FDA. Dr. Stone. Good morning. This is Kelly Stone. I'm the Associate Director for Therapeutic Review, Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care, FDA. Dr. Bolos. Good morning. This is Dr. Elizabeth Bolos. I'm a medical officer in the Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care and the primary reviewer for this application. Dr. Kim. Good morning. This is Yang Lian Kim. I'm a statistical uh, team leader for FDA. Dr. An. Hi, this is Dr. Dong Yan An, primary statistical reviewer in Office of Biostatistics. Thank you, everyone. I will turn it back to the chair. The topics that are being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are quite strongly held. Our goal is that this meeting will be fair and open forum for discussion of these issues and that individuals can express their views without interruption. But as a general reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson. We look forward to a productive meeting. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in the Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committees take care of their conversations about the topic at hand. Um, I'm sorry, um, topic at hand take place in the open forum of this meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with the FDA about these proceedings. However, FDA will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topics during breaks or lunch. Thank you. Dr. Takia Stevenson will read the conflict of interest statements for the meeting. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, is convening today's meeting of the Pulmonary Allergy Drugs Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, of 1972. With the exception of the industry representative, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees, SGEs, or regular federal employees from other agencies, and they're subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws are covered by but not limited to those founded at 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee's services outweighs his or her potential financial conflict of interest or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the, the discussions of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children, and for purposes of 18 U.S.C. Section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, products, teaching, speaking, writing, patents, royalties, and primary employment. Today's agenda involves a discussion of new drug application, NDA 214070, for a fixed dose combination of budesonide and albuterol sulfate, BDA, meter dose inhaler submitted by AstraZeneca and Bond Avilion 2 Development LP. 
the proposed indication is as needed treatment or prevention of bronchoconstriction and for the prevention of exacerbations in patients with asthma four years of age and older. This is a particular matters meeting during which specific matters related to AstraZeneca and Bond Avillion 2 developments NDA will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by the committee members and temporary voting members, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued in connection with this meeting. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements that they have made concerning the product at issue. With respect to FDA's invited industry representative, we would like to disclose that Dr. Dawn Carlson is participating in this meeting as a non-voting industry representative acting on behalf of regulated industry. Dr. Carlson's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Dr. Carlson is employed by AbV. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the firm at issue. Thank you, and I'll hand it back to the chair. Um, can I just do a quick sound check? Is this uh, better? Hi, Dr. Al, this is Kia speaking. I still, I'm not sure if your microphone is maybe has some sort of obstruction? It shouldn't. Um, is this better? I just moved it close to my my face. Um, why don't we Why don't we proceed? Um, if everyone can hear me, okay. Uh, we will proceed with the FDA introductory remarks from Dr. Kelly Stone. Uh, good morning. On, on behalf of the Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care in the agency, I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting of the Pulmonary Allergy Drugs Advisory Committee. We're convening the advisory committee today, today to discuss a new drug application for the six-dose combination budesonide albuterol MDI developed for the as-needed treatment or prevention of bronchoconstriction and for the pre prevention of exacerbations in patients with asthma four years of age and older. This is a novel combination product containing an inhaled corticosteroid and a short-acting beta-2 agonist and intended for use as a rescue or reliever treatment for asthma. This reliever product would be the first with an indication to prevent progression to severe exacerbations and the first product containing an inhaled corticosteroid for rescue rather than maintenance treatment. We will discuss the overall development program for this novel combination product. However, a major focus of today's discussion will be on the benefit risk assessment for pediatric patients. We look forward to a robust discussion to inform and advise the agency in its review of this new drug application. Although the feedback provided by the committee is advisory, we will consider all aspects of today's discussion in our review process. Once again, I would like to welcome and thank the members of the advisory committee for your participation in today's meeting, as well as the applicant, members of the public, and my colleagues at FDA. I'll now turn it back over to you, Dr. Rao. Thank you. Both the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages all participants, including the applicant's non-employee presenters, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that may, they may have with a sponsor, such as consulting fees, travel expenses, honoraria, interests, uh, in the sponsor, including equity, interest, and those based upon outcome of the meeting. 
Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your presentation to advise the committee if you, have not, if you do not have such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your presentation, it will not preclude you from speaking. We will now proceed with the applicant's summary presentation. Good morning to the Chair, members of the Advisory Committee and the FDA. My name is Dr. Ed Piper from AstraZeneca. BDA-MDI is a potential new asthma rescue treatment, and I'm pleased to summarize the Avilion and AstraZeneca position on the key topics that the Committee will discuss today. Dr. Neil Skolnick will follow to provide his clinical perspective. I'm joined by a number of colleagues from AstraZeneca and Avilion, and collectively we will address any questions and Doctors Lagogo, Murphy, and Skolnick are on hand to offer their expert clinical perspectives. Severe asthma exacerbations remain a major issue across all ages, and there is a need for safe and effective new treatments to prevent them. But there's a paradox that the go-to asthma rescue treatment, albuterol, when used frequently without an inhaled corticosteroid, is associated with an increased risk of severe exacerbation. BDA is a fixed-dose combination of albuterol to provide rapid relief of symptoms and budesonide to treat airway inflammation. The clinical premise behind the development was that BDA-MDI would reduce severe asthma exacerbation risk through the complementary action of these two well-known medicines. The pivotal Mandala study showed that when used as rescue in addition to inhaled corticosteroid maintenance treatment, both doses of BDA studied reduced the risk of first severe asthma exacerbation compared to albuterol. The efficacy profile of BDA 160-180, the higher dose tested, was compelling, with a 27% reduction in severe exacerbation risk together with clinically important reductions in systemic corticosteroid use and increased odds of improved asthma control and asthma-related quality of life scores. These important clinical benefits were observed with modest use of BDA as rescue. The mean use of BDA 160-180 was 2.6 inhalations per day, which is equivalent to just over 200 micrograms of budesonide. On most days during the study, patients used zero, one, or two doses of BDA. The numbers of inhalations are categorized on the graph here. We assess the overall benefit risk for BDA MDI to be positive, taking into account the three positive phase three studies in over 4,000 patients, the reduction in severe exacerbation risk compared to albuterol, highest with BDA 160-180, and critically, that the safety profile of BDA-MDI was consistent with the known risks of both monocomponents, with no new safety findings identified. We propose an indication that reflects the clinical utility of BDA-MDI. The principal question for the advisory committee is whether a high degree of extrapolation of the BDA efficacy data in adults to adolescents and children is appropriate and supports the approval of BDA MDI from four years of age. This question is important as the burden of asthma exacerbations in the US presented here as the annual rate of ED visits due to asthma remains stubbornly high for children, adolescents and their families. The unmet need is clear, considering that half of children with mild to moderate asthma and two-thirds of those with severe asthma have at least one asthma exacerbation each year. Given the potential for BDA-MDI to address severe exacerbation risk, we discussed the inclusion of children with the agency throughout development. We followed agency advice to include subjects from four years of age in our phase three studies 
and we enrolled 100 adolescents and 83 children into the Mandala study. These cohorts were intended to be of sufficient size to collect safety data and for exploratory efficacy analysis. The agency also recommended Bayesian analysis as an appropriate approach to support the assessment of efficacy in both pediatric populations. The FDA guide sponsors that for conditions that exist across the age spectrum, evidence of clinical benefit from a drug in adults can support the prospect of direct benefit in children if there is confidence that the disease is similar and that the response to treatment will be similar. We agree with FDA that a high degree of extrapolation of adult BDA data to the pediatric populations is necessary. Our rationale for extrapolation is based on important similarities in asthma across ages. These start with a general observation that the same principles are used for diagnosis, assessment, and treatment, whilst the same endpoints are used to assess efficacy in asthma. We acknowledge that there are differences in immunological mechanisms at different ages. However, there are similarities that are especially relevant to BDA as a rescue treatment. All asthma patients experience episodes of worsening symptoms and exacerbations in response to triggers. And these episodes are characterized by similar patterns of inflammation and bronchoconstriction. And the treatment approach is the same, using bronchodilators and systemic steroids for severe exacerbations. These similarities support the conclusion that a rescue medicine that's effective in adults would also be effective in pediatrics. And this conclusion is further supported by studies of other ICS fast-acting bronchodilator rescue treatments, which show reductions in severe exacerbation risk across adults, adolescents, and children. We look forward to the committee's discussion on the appropriateness of extrapolation. Turning to the efficacy data from the adolescent cohort in Mandala, we acknowledge the small sample size, relatively few severe exacerbation events, and the wide confidence and intervals that result. The primary endpoint estimate favored BDA 8180, but was reversed for the higher dose. Bayesian modeling, with limited borrowing from the overall population, resulted in favorable point estimates for both BDA MDI doses, but with credible intervals that cross unity. We agree with the agency's analysis, which shows that in order to achieve statistical significance, higher degrees of borrowing are required. It's encouraging that all secondary endpoints tested numerically favored both BDA MDI doses compared with albuterol. With regard to safety, the incidence of adverse events were low. Both BDA doses were similarly well tolerated, and the safety profile in adolescents was similar to that in adults and consistent with the known risks of both monocomponents. The rationale for extrapolation of efficacy from adults to adolescents is supported by the literature. Here we see the results of a pooled meta-analysis from six studies of budesonide formoterol rescue in over 1,800 adolescents with asthma. Reduction in severe exacerbation risk was 51% in the adolescent pool. And importantly, the results in adolescents were consistent with those in adults, supporting the rationale to extrapolate BDA MDI efficacy from adults to adolescents. We wanted to prospectively address the rationale for the adolescent dose we propose. Though the efficacy results appear to favor BDA MDI 8180 over 160 180, we believe that this is likely due to chance as a result of the low numbers of adolescent patients. It seems implausible that the lower BDA dose would outperform in adolescents given the very clear dose response in the overall Mandala population across all endpoints. We also note that the patterns of use for both BDA doses were similar in adolescents. Therefore, 
as both BDA doses were well tolerated with no unexpected safety findings, we propose BDA MDI 160 180 for adolescents. Moving now to the data for the 80180 BDA dose studied in children. There's uncertainty in BDA MDI benefit with point estimates for both severe exacerbation endpoints approximately at unity and with wide confidence intervals. The conclusions from the Bayesian analysis are the same as for adolescents, and secondary endpoints are inconclusive. A similar pattern of use was observed for BDA, MDI, and albuterol in children. On over 40% of days, no BDA, MDI, or albuterol was used, and more than eight inhalations were recorded on less than 1% of study days in both treatment groups importantly indicating that rescue was not overused. The incidence of adverse events was low and the safety profile consistent with the known risks of the monocomponents. The potential risks associated with increased corticosteroid exposure in children are an important consideration and we therefore simulated a worst case scenario in which BDA MDI was inhaled every 20 minutes for a maximum of 12 inhalations, either on a single day or on six repeated days. And this was in addition to maintenance budesonide at a range of approved doses. The simulation shown shows here that the systemic budesonide exposure measured as 24-hour AUC, is lower in the two age groups of children compared to adults and adolescents. And this concurs with the FDA analysis presented. And as I showed previously, it's very important to note that the pattern of BDA use in Mandala reassures us that this type of worst case scenario is both infrequent and would last only for short periods. There is also literature that supports the effectiveness of the ICS fast-acting bronchodilator rescue strategy in children. In the STAY study, in 4 to 11-year-olds with poor asthma control despite maintenance inhaled steroids, the use of budesonide formoterol rescue reduced the risk of exacerbation by 66% compared to the Saba rescue to butylene. Whilst on the right-hand side, we see the Trexa study in which in 6 to 18-year-olds with well-controlled mild persistent asthma, rescue therapy with beclomethasone and albuterol showed benefits over albuterol taken on its own. This is shown here as a reduction in treatment failures during the study. So in summary, we believe that the positive benefit risk of BDA extends to adolescents and children for the following reasons. Firstly, BDA MDI safety is consistent with the well-established safety profile of albuterol and budesonide, with no new safety findings identified in pediatric subgroups. Secondly, there is a strong clinical and pharmacological rationale to extract adult BDA efficacy to the pediatric population. And finally, there is strong plausibility that BDA MDI would reduce severe exacerbation risk based on the strength of the overall population results in Mandala together with the published data of other ICS fast-acting bronchodilator rescue combinations. Given the important unmet need and considering the totality of data, AstraZeneca and Avilion believe that the potential benefits of BDA, MDI outweigh the potential risks and that it could be an important therapeutic option for pediatric patients as well as for adults. And so we therefore propose the 160-180 microgram dose in subjects 12 years of age and older and the 80-180 microgram dose in those 4 to 11 years of age. Thank you. And I'd now like to invite Dr. Neil Skolnick to provide his clinical perspective.
Dr. Skolnick. Thank you, Dr. Piper. I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, Professor of Family and Community Medicine at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University. It is a privilege to be able to contribute my perspective to today's discussion. I am a paid consultant to the sponsor, but have no financial interest in the outcome of this meeting. I've been taking care of adults, adolescents, and children across the full spectrum of acute and chronic illness for the last 30 years. And most relevant to today's discussion, many, many patients with asthma. I am a family doctor. One of my academic interests is in asthma. And I served on the NHLBI Expert Working Group 4, contributing to the development of the most recent NIH asthma guidelines. So this is an area that I know well. The rate of emergency room visits for asthma exacerbations has not changed since I started practice over 30 years ago. This may be because our approach to rescue therapy has continued to be focused on acute relief of bronchoconstriction, leaving inflammation, which is a critical cause of bronchoconstriction, to go on unabated. Saba, when used alone, only addresses bronchoconstriction, leaving patients transiently feeling better and vulnerable to severe exacerbations as their inflammation continues to get worse to the point where SAB is no longer effective at relieving symptoms, and the improvement in airflow requires administration of systemic corticosteroids. BDA use as rescue therapy provides rapid bronchodilation while addressing inflammation acutely through non-genomic effects on the airways that begin within minutes, as well as genomic effects that take their place over hours. The use of ICS as a part of rescue therapy is not a new concept. And as we've heard in my colleagues' presentations, the idea is supported by evidence that quick-acting bronchodilator ICS rescue combinations reduce the risk of exacerbations versus SABA alone across severities of asthma in adults, adolescents, and children. This is why both the international GINA recommendations and the United States NIH guidelines now recommend the strategy of using ICS when a quick-acting bronchodilator is used as rescue therapy across age groups. These guidelines are formulated with the intent of informing clinical decisions about treatment. In both the GINA and the NIH recommendations, adults and adolescents are grouped together. And ICS quick-acting bronchodilator is recommended as rescue therapy. For children, both GINA and NIH recommendations support the use of a ICS quick-acting bronchodilator as rescue treatment, the difference between the two sets of recommendations only being at which step it is recommended. Based on careful analysis of the data, some of which we've seen in the pre-recorded discussions and some of which have been reviewed today, both GINA and NIH guidelines recommend that clinicians use an ICS quick-acting beta agonist for rescue therapy in children with moderate to severe asthma. Let me now discuss why I, as a prescribing physician, would like to be able to use BDA MDI for my younger patients. In order to do so, let me discuss clinical decision making in primary care. When I make clinical decisions for my patients, there are a number of factors I consider. First of all, as an academic family physician, I take the guidelines very seriously. And we've seen an approach that uses rescue therapy with BDA, MDI is in line with the current guidelines. Then I look carefully at the data in peer-reviewed literature to assess whether that literature and the guidelines are applicable to my patients. Then I think about my clinical experience. 
With asthma, my approach to children, that is their assessment and their treatment, is essentially the same as it is for adolescents and adults. When I look at the Mandela trial, I see results in adults that are consistent with what is known about the use of ICS quick-acting bronchodilator rescue therapy. I see no reason to believe that the efficacy in children and adolescents would be different than that in the population as a whole in the trial. The trial showed important decreases in severe exacerbations and decreases in systemic steroid use. These results, along with the published data that Dr. Murphy shared in his recorded presentation and Dr. Piper reviewed just a short while ago, give me reason to believe in the efficacy of BDA, MDI across age groups. Of critical importance, I believe that the risks associated with BDA, MDI in children are well understood based on extensive experience with both of its components over many years. And I believe those risks are low and are manageable. Let me reemphasize this. Based on over 40 years of clinical trials and clinical experience with budesonide in, in adults, and over 20 years of worldwide experience with budesonide in children, as well as a similar level of experience with albuterol, we can feel comfortable that we understand any safety issues that there may be with BDA MDI. Favorable benefit to risk ratio with an emphasis on safety is what we seek and what our patients want in the medicines we use for treatment of any disease. Finally, there are the approved indications for the medications I would like to use. As a primary care physician, I find myself in an uncomfortable and an unusual circumstance with asthma. While it is true that many specialists may feel comfortable prescribing outside of approved indications, most primary care clinicians try to prescribe medicines consistent with approved indications. If I want to practice medicine consistent with the current guidelines, consistent with the peer-reviewed literature, and consistent with what I believe is best for my patients, I currently only have two options. One is to prescribe a budesonide for motor oil combination inhaler for maintenance and reliever therapy. If I do that, it is not consistent with the approved indications for prescribing that medication. And in fact, it violates the statement in the label that it is not indicated for the relief of acute bronchospasm. Furthermore, if my patients are taking their maintenance inhaler, insurance often does not pay for the additional inhalers to be used for rescue therapy. My second option is to recommend to my patients that they take their ICS every time they take albuterol. Use of an ICS in this way does not fit approved indications for ICS use. For my patients, this is burdensome, confusing, and impractical. It means they have to carry two inhalers with them at all times in case they need rescue therapy, and we run up against the same insurance issues that I just mentioned if someone's also on a maintenance ICS. Insurance won't pay for additional ICS for rescue. So I do what most of my colleagues do, family doctors, pediatricians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants across the country. I don't practice according to what I think is best for my patients. Instead, I prescribe an albuterol inhaler for rescue therapy. From my perspective, BDA MDI provides us a much needed opportunity to align the approved indications with best clinical practices. Approval of BDA-MDI would provide an option 
to address the paradox that Dr. Piper mentioned, that the go-to asthma rescue treatment, albuterol, when used frequently without an ICS, is associated with an increased risk of severe exacerbations. Currently, in the United States, this happens far too often. So we're left today with the principal questions. Is the disease similar enough in children and adults? Is the process and underlying physiology of exacerbations similar enough in children and adults? And is the response to treatment similar enough in children and adults to support extrapolation of the results of the Mandala trial to children from adults? And is the totality of the evidence from clinical studies interpreted with clinical wisdom strong enough to support approval of BDA-MDI for adults, adolescents, and children? For the reasons stated, I think it is. The alternative without BDA-MDI is for primary care providers like me to have no other options for rescue therapy but to prescribe albuterol for our patients. With BDA-MDI, we could provide an important advance for the treatment of asthma in the United States, one that gives our patients anti-inflammatory therapy as a part of their rescue therapy, and by so doing, decrease the rate of asthma exacerbations in adults, adolescents, and children, improving their quality of life and decreasing the burden of their disease. Thank you, and I'll now turn the floor back to Dr. Piper. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, the sponsor summary, so I'll pass it back to uh, the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now take clarifying questions for the applicant. Please use your raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question, and remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you have asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record. Uh, before you speak and direct your questions to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and end of your follow-up question with that is all for my questions. So we can move on to the next panel member. Thank you. Why don't we start with Dr. Oster? Yes. Yes, this is Randy Oster. I, I am not a medical doctor. I am the consumer representative. Um, and what I'd like to do is ask Dr. Piper to talk a little bit about the 4,000 patients in the study and explain to us the, when he talked about the triggers are the same, how the study looked at age and location of where they are for environmental triggers so that if we decide to um, extrapolate data, it is clear that the study has looked at environmental factors that can be exasperations. Thank you. Ed Piper, AstraZeneca. Uh, so thank you. Uh, indeed, 4,000 patients in the clinical development program spread across three studies. Uh, 3,000 of those patients in Mandala, the study I uh, referred to a lot. Um, 
This was a uh, program run in a number of countries around the world, including the United States. Uh, for example, uh, in the Mandala study, 27% of the overall sample was uh, taken from the, from the United States. So we can be confident that the patients uh, recruited into the trial uh, are relevant when we come to consider U.S. practice and indeed U.S. Tr you know, triggers that are uh, present in uh, patients in the U.S. as we consider the uh, uh, application for U.S. approval. Uh, we did capture data around environmental triggers uh, in, in the study, so we have data that shows um, the sorts of triggers the patients recorded, so we made an effort to, uh, uh, to uh, collect that data. We haven't got an analysis to share with you at this moment about the breakdown of exactly what those triggers were. Um, but I'll end my uh, response there and see whether that satisfies your question around the 27% uh, of patients being in the U.S. or, or not, or whether you uh, have a follow-up question. Thank you. So just as a follow-up, I just want to clarify for the record that we do not have the analysis for the triggers and the environmental um, impact across the United States has not been defined at a level where there could be um, man-made issues so that uh, we have to be careful that we do not extrapolate data from one part of the country to uh, people to in the other part. And so that's, no, thank you. Ed Piper, I see anything just to come back on that and give you a tiny little bit more detail around U.S. Uh, sites. As I said, 27% of the patients uh, there were 125 different sites around the United States uh, that enrolled patients into the Mandala study. So I think we can have some confidence about the generalizability of the data from uh, the U.S. population. Thank you. Let's go on to uh, Dr. Greenberger. Thank you. Uh, a couple uh, questions. One would be inclusion criteria for Mandela regarding bronchodilator responsiveness or not. And this would be, my question is regarding the adolescents and children, if you have information on that. And the second is, could you just review for us the, those adolescents and children in step two who were receiving the investigational product versus the step three treated who received the investigational product. Thank you. Ed Piper, AstraZeneca, I'm going to start with your second question first, which is around looking at uh, the background dose of inhaled steroid. One of the great strengths of the Mandala study, I think, was that it recruited a broad population of patients, uh, taking all of whom were taking inhaled steroids, with or without a LABA, uh, and with the addition of one controller, additional controller where required. So it was a broad study, but what we chose to do in, uh, was to look at uh, the different patients by background severity using different doses uh, of, uh, the, the different doses of steroid that they received using the gene categorization. So we can show you uh, the breakdown of the data by background dose from the pediatric an adolescent sample. So we'll pull that data for you. And while we're pulling that data, your first question was around the inclusion criteria for reversibility in adolescents and children. Uh, and I'm going to pass you to Dr. Weinberger, our clinical expert, who will re respond to that question. Mark Weinberg, Avillion. The requirements from an inclusion criteria were that uh, pre-bronchodilator FEV1 of greater than 40 to less than 90 predicted normal value for adults and greater than 60 percent predicted normal for subjects aged 4 to 17 um, after withholding medications as, and then followed up for post-bronchodilator. With specific values, um, we can assess 
what we had for our adolescent patients. Thank you. And so to go back to the question of the background inhaled corticosteroids in the adolescent and pediatric patients, I'm going to pass uh, to Dr. Church, our pediatric lead, to walk you through the split of background dose of ICS. Dr. Church. Alison Church, AstraZeneca. So um, what I'm going to share with you first is the proportion of adolescents in each category of ICS. So for uh, patients on low-dose ICS, about 32% of the adolescents, slide up, was there, were on uh, low-dose ICS. Um, approximately 54% of patients were on medium-dose ICS, and 14% of patients were on high-dose ICS. So that's in the adolescents. We also have that data in children. Slide up. In children, approximately 5% of patients were on a background of low-dose ICS. 63% were on medium-dose ICS. And roughly 30% were on high-dose ICS. I believe you also asked about reversibility. Um, so we did look at reversibility, and it was quite similar across the three treatment groups. In children, reversibility was 20%. In adolescents, it was 29%. And in the overall population, it was approximately 28%. Thank you. Any other uh, follow-up questions, Dr. Greenberger? If not, let's move on to... Uh, I, I do, Dr. Al, I do have a question. I, were there any... Uh, my question on inclusion criteria is were there children or adolescents who did not have a 12% response to bronchodilator that were included? Ed Piper said, and again, no, they were not. They were all reversible. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Stoller? Yes, good morning. Uh, this is Jamie Stoller. Um, I have a question uh, regarding uh, figure nine in the sponsor's briefing document, the strata of the subgroup analyses, and in some ways it's a a possible follow-up to Dr. Uh, to Ms. Oster's question. It regards the, the possibility of center effects. And if I look at recognizing that Mandala was conducted, uh, I believe, in 11 countries, you've stratified in the middle of figure nine regional effects, uh, particularly U.S. versus non-U.S. I take note of the fact that the, uh, the forest plot in non-U.S. is consistent with the overall impact, and yet um, the uh, the data from the U.S. groups um, sort of cross the line of unity. And, and I wonder, therefore, whether there is a center effect and uh, whether you can comment on on why that is other than, um, you know, the possibility of uh, inadequate power. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Ed Piper, I think you ended your question with a really important point, which uh, is that we recognize the study isn't powered to draw statistically robust conclusions between any um, subgroup, and therefore we have to be very cautious about interpreting the data with respect to any difference in efficacy between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Uh, as I mentioned in my first response, the U.S. cohort was 27% of the overall uh, Mandala sample, and so what we see in terms of difference does not exceed uh, what could be explained by chance uh, alone. So I think in a summary, I think we believe strongly that uh, this data doesn't suggest that there is a difference. Thank you. No follow-up question from Dr. Stoller. Let's go to Dr. Hoekman. Thank you. Uh, good morning. This is Fernando Olguin, University of Colorado. My question is, I believe patients on biologicals were excluded. Would you mind telling us what was the rationale for that exclusion? And if so, is the um, 
BDA, MDI application in this subgroup different because they were excluded from the trial? Thank you. Ed Piper, AstraZeneca. So we focused uh, Mandala uh, on a population of moderate to severe uh, patients with, with asthma in order to evaluate the additive impact of BDA as rescue on top of maintenance steroids. As I mentioned, it is a fairly broad trial already with patients uh, going from low, medium, high-dose inhaled steroids, plus or minus LABA, plus uh, a potential one additional controller being a uh, could be theophylline, could be a leukotriene receptor antagonist, um, could be a LAMA. And I think so we already had a trial that was very broad and heterogeneous. And I think one of the strengths is showing a 27% reduction in a population uh, that's as broad as that is, is clinically uh, and compelling. We did take a decision not to include patients uh, with biologics because I think we acknowledge those are a severe, very severe patient population. They fortunately represent a relatively small proportion of the overall population, uh, and we thought that was just uh, too far in terms of uh, opening a, a really broad uh, trial to be too broad. So we did make that decision. Your observation is correct, and that's the reason behind it from our perspective. Thank you. Any follow-up questions from Dr. Hoquin? Um, if not, let's yes. move. Uh, thank you, Dr. So you're not concerned that the, the uh, BDA, MDI would be used in this population? Um, I, I, I mean, as I said, there's no, uh, we, we didn't run the study including the, those patients. Um, I think there's every reason to believe that the product would still be effective in in, uh, in those patients, but they are a special population as you as you identify, and I don't have data to be able to offer you to, to, to address your question. Um, I think it's a, a good point to make. Thank you. Great. Um, if no other follow-up questions, um, let's move on to Dr. Evans, please. I don't hear you. I apologize. I seem to have been double muted. This is Scott Evans. Can you hear me now? Yes, quite well. Thank you. Apologize for that. Um, this is Scott Evans from MD Anderson. I have a, uh, a pharmacokinetics question. I recall from the, um, the videos uh, a comparison between exposures to the BDA MDI uh, and the uh, approved um, uh, Pulmacort uh, uh, rescuals uh, in children. Uh, I think some of those data are in Table 2 of uh, the sponsor document now. Um, um, and my question is, is to please refresh me from what I thought I learned in the, um, the video, which is, what is the systemic exposure achieved in children um, following the use of uh, the BDA-MDI at the expected usage versus the approved usage of uh, Pulmacort rest fuels. Thank you. So, um, Ed Piper, AstraZeneca, I think what I can show you uh, is the systemic exposure for budesonide that we've estimated through population PK modeling uh, in addition to maintenance treatment in adults, adolescents, and children. I think that might be a useful uh, place to start trying to answer your question. Let's show you that data and see whether we uh, see whether you address uh, what underpins your question. So I'm going to ask Dr. Asimus, our clinical pharmacology expert, to uh, share that data.
Thor Asimus, AstraZeneca. So, um, slide up. This slide shows the simulations that we have performed to evaluate the exposure of BDA MDI on top of the use of pharmacotrespials. And uh, this slide shows the um, AUC over 24 hours with and without maintenance treatment. The maintenance treatment are given by different symbols and the different um, dosing scenarios with BDA MDI are given in different colors. And as you can see, the systemic exposure to budesonide is scaling linearly with the increase in, to in total dose of budesonide. And um, the um, maximum increase in exposure compared to maintenance is about twofold in the mandala maximum scenario. And if the children are taking two or three extra inhalations, the ex uh, increase in exposure is about 18% and 28% respectively. Thank you. So that was an analysis we had. Does that uh, help to answer your question, or would you? It, 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 no, it actually does. I uh, covered the, the two elements in one slide that I was asking, so thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, I believe the next person is uh, Dr. Tracy. Yes, this is Dr. Tracy. This question is for uh, Dr. Piper. You know, I, as I looked at all of the, the stuff that you've had a chance to review, I mean, obviously it would have been nice to have had larger sample sizes to improve the power for both the uh, pediatric and adolescent groups. But recognizing that really the central question here is, is there is enough disease similarity between adults and kids, I was just kind of wondering if either as a sponsor, and I'll, I'll ask this of the agency also, um, Obviously, as a sponsor, you think that things look pretty good. But were there any specific areas that maybe just kind of gave you pause, made you want to think that maybe there isn't sufficient similarities in these two populations? Thank you. Ed Piper, uh, AstraZeneca. I mean, as I described in, in my presentation, we believe that in the context of a rescue treatment, the similarities in, in asthma uh, are sufficient to warrant the extrapolation of efficacy that we're proposing. So it, it's probably no surprise that I come back to you to say, no, I don't think uh, we had a concern. We've thought about this very carefully, but we do believe that extrapolation uh, is uh, an in, a justifiable thing to do for, for BDA for the reasons described. Um, I think the other thing that uh, I'm sure you picked up from my presentation is some of the data from other um, fast-acting bronchodilator inhaled, com inhaled steroid combinations is also uh, reassuring because we see, certainly for budesonide formotrol, that similar benefit in terms of reduction in severe exacerbation risk across the span of ages. Uh, and we also see uh, that uh, that product is uh, is safe in in all those age groups. So for those two reasons, uh, I think we feel confident that extrapolation is appropriate here. But I understand that's going to be a major topic for, uh, for for this meeting. But that's our perspective. Thank you. No, no, that was that was I was expecting that answer, but I just wanted to kind of hear what he had to say. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the next is, is is actually me. I'm David. Um, I guess I have a, a somewhat. Um, uh, I have a question that really kind of um, speaks to the the rationale for including children and adolescents to begin with, which is. I think the, the thrust of the argument here is um, presented by the applicant is, is really focused on, um, you know, the preponderance of evidence outside the clinical trial. 
uh, that are being presented here. And uh, so I, I guess I'm, the question I'm asking is why include adolescents and children uh, if we're being asked to, uh, you know, consider indications that uh, are not directly um, derived from uh, the trial data uh, that you're presenting here today. Thank you. Uh, it's a, Ed Piper, it's a little difficult to, to hear the question, but uh, let me repeat it. And as what I understood you were asking. Us Hello. Is Hello, everyone. This is Takia speaking to DFO. Dr. Al, I do believe you may be on speakerphone. Um, it may help if you do have um, headphones or microphones to maybe use that instead because, yes, we, it is difficult to hear um, your, your question and when you speak. I apologize. Is this better? Yes, that is a little bit better, yes. I'm not sure why it, um, you can so clear to me otherwise. I apologize. Um, I'm so I sorry, Dr. Al. I, I still, it's, your signal is probably still going in and out. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a solution for me. Why don't I do this? Let's move on to the other, um, let's move on to Dr. Cloutier, and I will try a different telephone. How about that? That's fine. Thank you, Dr. Al. Sorry for the interruption. Ed, no, not at all. I, I think I caught the gist of the question, so let me try, try and help, which I think it, the question was, uh, what is it that you learned having included a small sample of pediatric and adolescent patients uh, given the challenges around uh, exploratory efficacy analysis? And I think I'd just like to point out two really important things that we did learn from including uh, the pediatric and adolescents. One was the safety, because this was a, an opportunity to explore BDA, MDI being used as needed in response to symptoms, and the safety profile that we observed was reassuring. And I think the second thing that I showed in my presentation was also the pattern of use, particularly in, in pediatrics, where one of our issues was to make sure that the product wasn't being overused. And I think comprehensively, uh, we saw that the, uh, the product was not being overused with uh, no BDA being used on 40% of days uh, and the profile being skewed very far to the left in terms of the pattern. So if that addresses, that's what I thought the question was. Um, so I hope that's helpful in, in addressing what we did see from uh, the uh, pediatric and adolescent populations. Thank you. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. I don't have a follow-up at this point. Um, why don't we go ahead? And, and move on to um, Dr. Cloutier. Uh, thank you. Um, this is Michelle Cloutier. So the Mandela study was conducted in uh, patients who had uncontrolled, moderate to severe persistent asthma. Are you, um, uh, that's your primary efficacy study, are you recommending that, that the BDA, MDI be used in um, individuals with asthma at all age, uh, for an up, uh, or asthma of all severity? Ed Piper, yes, AstraZeneca. So your observation, uh, Professor Cloutier, is absolutely right. Mandala was conducted in uncontrolled, moderate to severe uh, patients, but we included uh, mild asthma patients, defined as those either taking SABA on their own or low-dose inhaled corticosteroids plus SABA in the program, particularly in Denali. And so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Weinberg to just uh, walk you through what we learned from Denali in mild patients, particularly with emphasis on uh, some exploratory data around exacerbation. So I'll pass uh, the microphone to Dr. Weinberg. Mark Weinberg, Avillion. So our exploration in mild asthma was the Denali study where we looked at 1,000 patients receiving the drug QID, which would support the combination rule and also administer the drug as these drugs are currently labeled. Uh, given that this was QID administration and that it was a 12-week study, we did not specify severe exacerbations as a uh, pre-specified endpoint to look at, but certainly did look at it in an exploratory manner. Slide up. Um, 
interestingly, what we saw was placebo patients, there were 14 severe exacerbations during the 12 weeks. Albuterol administered QID had 20 severe exacerbations with fully 10% of those patients um, requiring treatment with systemic corticosteroids. And then for the BDA arms, four and five patients. So this is some supportive data in, in mild asthma that we have, as well as the very good safety data that comes out of the Denali study. Thank you. So, thank you. So if I could follow up with that, but how, how, are, you, how are you recommending that, that uh, this therapy be used in children 12, 5 to 12 years of age who have mild asthma? And the reason for that is, is first of all, the NAPP guidelines um, do not recommend uh, uh, this therapy in children uh, 4 to 11 years of age uh, because of the low quality um, data, uh, uh, low certainty uh, involved with these data. So TREXA did not support uh, intermittent um, ICS albuterol um, rescue for the primary outcome. And it also, uh, the goal of that study had been to demonstrate the added value of, of ICS um, albuterol uh, to prevent exacerbations. And it did not do that either. And Chopin's study, which is the other study that you quote, uh, support that really had a very different um, study design uh, with six months of continuous ICS therapy before randomization. And that study demonstrated the superiority of daily ICS uh, over intermittent um, therapy. Um, so do you have additional data or other data that support um, use of the BDA MDI in mild uh, persistent asthma in children 5 to 12 years of age? Thank you. Ed Piper, AstraZeneca. Uh, there isn't additional data. I think uh, you, you've highlighted the, uh, the data well. Um, I showed in my presentation, I did reference uh, TREXA, and the data that I showed slide up was uh, this data, which was in uh, a patient population with mild persistent asthma. Uh, I cited on the, on the right-hand side of this graph two, com the comparison between the patients that received um, beclomethazone and albuterol as needed on its own as rescue compared to the patients who received albuterol on its own as rescue. And the, uh, the reason for doing that was to show that clearly the addition of beclomethazone in this case in the rescue uh, prevented treatment failures in the TREXA study. So th that was the data that I presented and the reason why I presented it. I think the remainder of your observations are, are sound. Uh, I don't have other data to, to present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great. Um, hopefully this is better. I've switched phones. Um, yes, we can hear you much better. Thank you. That's great. I'm happy to hear that. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Kim? Uh, Edwin Kim, University of North Carolina. I don't have any conflicts in this. Uh, my question is focused on the children, the ages 4 to 12, and the efficacy data that uh, appears to be inconclusive. And in thinking about uh, BDA as a rescue therapy, I guess my question uh, is around your slide 11, where there is um, a lot of justification for extrapolating from adults to adolescents to children and makes a point of uh, treatment and diagnosis all being identical. Uh, but the dose selected for that younger group was the lower dose, and a high dose was not studied. And I wonder, could you speak to whether you would anticipate that the higher dose could be more effective in prevention of severe exacerbation? That, uh, thank you. 
Head Piper AstraZeneca. I'm going to pass to Dr. Church to take you through uh, our rationale for selecting the 8180 dose uh, for the 4 to 12 uh, age group, and that uh, will explain why we're not thinking about the higher dose. But uh, Dr. Church. Allison Church, AstraZeneca. So when we considered what doses we would take into the Mandala study, uh, we made that determination based on what we knew about the drugs, also what had been shown previously with budesonide for motorolus rescue, as well as based on a dose ranging study that we conducted. Um, and generally speaking, the um, ICS dose for children is usually one half that for adults. And considering safety, that's the dose that we chose to take into the Mandala study. Slide up. One of the reasons that we thought the 80 microgram dose would be the correct dose comes from the STAY study, in which for motorol, uh, budesonide for motorol at the dose of 80 was studied as a rescue on top of budesonide for motorol. And what we observe here is a 66% reduction in the risk of severe exacerbations. So that is the reason why we chose to take the 80 microgram dose uh, into children. And we did see uh, improvements in, or reductions in risk of severe exacerbations and rate with the, one, the 8180 dose of budesonide albuterol within the Mandala study. Thank you. I don't have any follow-ups. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Oster? Yes, this is Randy Asta, the consumer representative. And I would just like some clarifying uh, statements around um, the understanding that this is a rescue treatment and it is effective. However, when we look at children and growth, I would like to understand there were some indications that growth is affected by some of these products. And yet I don't know um, if children um, just take this for the 24-week period, or we're looking at children that take this over their childhood, and what is the effect of growth rates on them, as well as um, there were charts that talked about the cumulative lifetime dose of corticosteroids um, with depression, anxiety, and then Dr. Church's information that she shared did indicate there were some mood swings, vomiting, and behavioral issues. And I'd like to understand, because we want to extrapolate from adults um, specifically the effect that this could have on children, and adults are no longer growing, but children are. Thank you. Uh, Ed Piper, AstraZeneca. Um, so your observations around growth are, are spot on. Uh, I would say that we didn't undertake a formal growth study in our development program, given that there is a large body of data with budesonide and other inhaled steroids uh, and examining the effect on growth in children. Um, so we know that as a backdrop uh, to the use of BDA. And I think it's very important to state from a patient perspective that we'll be uh, including uh, information about those well-known effects on growth of inhaled steroids in the patient package insert to make sure that patients uh, uh, and children and their uh, carers are aware of um, the what is known around this topic. And the language that we'll use will be consistent with the approved class labeling uh, of inhaled steroids that's uh, familiar with us today. So that uh, issue is not lost on us, and it's very important that uh, people are informed about it. But as you've seen from the pattern of use data that I showed you in pediatrics, uh, our belief is that uh, the additional exposure of BDA, MDI to children is relatively low, uh, and we're not expecting any incremental uh, impact on slowing of growth velocity as a result of use of BDA, MDI's rescue. Thank you. Um, 
we are a little bit um, behind uh, time now. <clears throat> Why don't we, uh, Dr. Cabana, let's take your question and we'll call that the last question before moving on. Thank you. Uh, this is Michael Cabana. Dr. Piper, my question was about slide 15 in your presentation. It was about the BDA MDI dose proposed for adolescents. It seems that there's an odd result here where the 80 over 180 outperformed the 160 over 180, but you're endorsing the 160 over 180 dose because it's likely due to chance that the result was due to low numbers. But it looks like there are about 30 patients in each group, I think 34 and 32. Why do you think the odd result happened with the higher dose, the 160 over 180? Isn't it equally possible that the 80 over 180 had an unlikely result due to chance and could have favored albuterol sulfate instead? Why do you think it's the 160 over 180 that performed in an unlikely manner? At Piper AstraZeneca, uh, yeah, we thought about this question uh, very carefully as we reviewed the data and just determined the uh, dose that we would uh, apply for for adolescents. And as I described, it doesn't seem plausible to us that the 80 microgram dose of budesonide would outperform the 160 microgram dose. And that's based particularly on the uh, effect in the overall study, which showed such a clear dose response for the higher dose, not only for the primary endpoint, but also for the um, secondary endpoints and indeed the exploratory endpoints. So given that typically uh, we see the adult and the adolescent dose uh, being the same. And in the absence of finding a plausible explanation, um, we went with the 160, 180 dose. And though I don't have the, the, the data at my fingertips, I think you mentioned that sample sizes were in the 30s. I think what we have to recognize here also is the actual number of exacerbation events in, in the adolescents were very small, they were a fraction of that. They were, I don't have the data with me, but it's something like eight or nine events. So the probability of skewing what you observe as a result of one or two events falling in a particular pattern, I think is very high. Um, and so that really, on top of the reasons I previously gave you, explain why we uh, proposed the higher dose. Thank you. This, this is Michael Cabana to follow up. If it's possible that the 160 over 180 could have been skewed to small numbers, couldn't the 80 over 180 been skewed due to small numbers? And isn't it a possible hypothesis as well that both doses don't work for kids less than 18? It, it seems like they both had equal sample sizes and there's equal chance that it, the 80 over 180 could have been just by chance as well. So there are Thanks, Ed Piper, AstraZeneca. Um, there are a couple of uh, points to, to raise, I think, in response to that. I think it's really important that we uh, appreciate that the Mandala data that we do have with the small sample actually don't rebut um, the assumptions that underpin our belief in extrapolation. So the, the BDA-MDI data that we observe in adolescents and children are within the range of the variability that we could expect given the small sample sizes uh, in the pediatric subgroup, the adolescent group in this case, and the overall uh, treatment group. So what we observed is not out with uh, that difference in, in sample size. And the second reason for um, our confidence in the higher dose uh, and the effectiveness of that dose is the data I showed you coming from the pooled analysis um, of the budesonide formoterol data in adolescents and comparing that to um, adults. And what you saw from that data was clear consistency in reduction of risks of severe exacerbation in adolescents and in um, adults. And in that study, the budesonide formoterol dose, budesonide was studied as 160 micrograms 
And so that was an additional reason why uh, we feel confident that uh, we are proposing the correct dose here for adolescents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> if there are no more clarifying questions for the applicant, we'll now proceed with the FDA summary presentation. Uh, good morning again. This is Kelly Stone, and I'm a pediatrician and allergist immunologist, as well as the associate director for therapeutic review in the Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care here in FDA. It's my pleasure to provide this overview to you this morning. And the purpose of this overview is really to highlight critical elements of our review of the DEA program to supplement details that were provided in our briefing document in pre-recorded uh, uh, presentations and to focus today's discussion. So I, I, again, we've gone through this, but uh, BDA is an oral inhalational aerosol that delivers a combination of either 40 or 80 micrograms of budesonide and 90 micrograms of albuterol for actuation. The proposed dosing regimen for uh, patients 12 years of age and older is two inhalations of the 80-90 uh, BDA, which gives you a total dose of 160 micrograms of budesonide or 180 of albuterol per dose. And for children 4 to less than 12, two inhalations of the 40 microgram budesonide, 90 microgram albuterol. And for both doses, uh, it's not to exceed six, dose, six doses or 12 inhalations over a 24-hour period. The proposed indication is for the as-needed treatment or prevention of bronchoconstriction, uh, which is consistent with the current wording for uh, SABAs. In addition, it adds for the prevention of exacerbation in patients with asthma four years of age and older. Uh, just to highlight terminology, I may refer to um, I, I, I may refer to um, high-dose BDA, which is the 160-180, and low-dose, which is the 80-180 uh, dose. To briefly provide an overview of asthma, asthma is a chronic respiratory disease characterized by bronchoconstriction and airway hyperresponsiveness, as well as airway inflammation. Although inhaled corticosteroids to address airway inflammation have been approved for the maintenance treatment of asthma. Inhaled corticosteroids have not been approved for reliever treatment of asthma exacerbations. Asthma is a common disease with an estimated U.S. prevalence of approximately 8% in both adults and children, and it represents one of the most common chronic childhood uh, illnesses. Asthma is heterogeneous with the spectrum of phenotypes and endotypes and a range of severities and symptoms. All patients with asthma, however, regardless of baseline severity or age, are vulnerable to episodic bronchoconstriction and increases in airway inflammation in response to triggers or acute exacerbations. And exacerbations uh, can be managed with as-needed short-acting beta agonists or for severe exacerbations with systemic corticosteroids, which may themselves uh, be associated with significant morbid morbidity. Severe exacerbations may also require hospitalization, higher prolonged systemic corticosteroids, and may result in death. The goals of asthma treatment are to control symptoms and prevent exacerbations. And the foundation of treatment has traditionally comprised controller inhalers, such as budesonide, and reliever treatments to alleviate symptoms, uh, such as albuterol. Since BDA was developed for use as a reliever inhaler, I'll provide additional background on the current landscape for uh, reliever medications. Presently, there's only one class of drug, short acting beta agonists, that are approved in the U.S. as reliever treatment for asthma. And albuterol accounts for the majority of clinical use. No reliever therapy carries the indication to prevent severe exacerbations. 
In recent years, however, there has been a paradigm shift in the approach to reliever treatment informed by the literature on asthma and subsequently reflected in recent guideline revisions. The first concept um, is, is asthmated use of an ICS and quick onset lava is both maintenance and reliever therapy, often known as SMART, which is now recommended by both GINA and in, in NIH guidelines for some steps in asthma management. We note that no ICS lava fixed dose combination inhaler is currently FDA approved for this indication. Similarly, there's literature regarding concomitant asthmated use of an ICS with SABA in response to symptoms, which is recommended by both set of guidelines as an alternative treatment for patients with mild asthma. EDA would represent the first FDA-approved ICS-SABA fixed-dose combination. As highlighted in the briefing document in the pre-recorded presentations, um, although the monocomponents of BDA, budesonide and albuterol, had both been FDA-approved for many years, BDA would represent a novel product in several ways. First, the proposed indication to prevent exacerbations would be new for a reliever treatment for asthma. Second, this would be the first approved product with an inhaled corticosteroid for reliever treatment rather than only for maintenance treatment, representing a new intended use for an inhaled corticosteroid in the treatment of asthma. And third, this would be the first fixed dose combination product combining an inhaled corticosteroid and beta agonist either short-acting or long-acting. So the meeting goals uh, are to discuss the data to support the efficacy of BDA for the proposed indication, and particularly to discuss if extrapolation of adult data to pediatric subjects is appropriate and if additional data is needed. We also ask the committee to discuss the safety data for BDA for the proposed indication with a particular focus on pediatric safety concerns. And then we'll uh, have questions uh, about benefit risk assessment that we break down into three age groups, greater than or equal to 18 years of age, 12 years of age to less than 18, and four to less than 12. And we break them down because we believe that the benefit risk assessment may be different uh, for the different uh, populations. The two trials most relevant to BDA, uh, the BDA application, are Mandala and Denali. Mandala was designed to demonstrate the contribution of an inhaled corticosteroid to the combined ICS-SABA combination when used as needed to prevent severe acute asthma exacerbations. And the agency views this trial as the primary source of efficacy data because of the size of the trial the exacerbation endpoint, and the administration of the investigative product as intended in real-world practice. Denali was designed to assess the contribution of each monocomponent to the effect on lung function and satisfies the combination rule. The, Although Mandela and Denali are both discussed in our briefing document, Mandela will be the focus of this morning's presentation uh, to focus advisory committee discussions. This is the design of Mandela. It was an event-driven, variable duration, but with a minimum of 24 weeks, randomized, double-blind, active comparator controlled trial in subjects with moderate to severe asthma. Uh, starting on the left side, uh, there was a two to four week screening and run-in period uh, where patients were provided a SABA. And then subjects were randomized, subjects greater than or equal to 12 years of age were randomized one to one to one to either high dose or low dose BDA or albuterol sulfate. And there are approximately 3,000 patients in, in, in this age cohort. Subjects four to less than 12 were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either low-dose BDA or to albuterol sulfate. And following randomization, uh, subjects were instructed to use BDA, PRN, 
in response to triggers and to alleviate symptoms just as they would with their usual reliever medication or SAVA. The key efficacy analyses were performed at the primary completion when 570 severe acute exacerbations had occurred and the last enrolled adult reached 24 weeks of treatment. And as noted at the bottom, all patients uh, came in on background asthma maintenance treatment that consisted of medium to high dose ICS with or without an additional controller or low to high dose ICS plus lava plus or minus additional controller treatment. And for all subjects who met primary completion date or discontinued treatment, there was a two-week follow-up uh, period. Mandala was powered based on adult and adolescent subjects greater than 12 years of age with a total plan sample size of 3,000 or 1,000 per treatment arm, which was calculated to provide 87% power to observe a 25% reduction in the risk of severe exacerbation. In addition, up to 100 patients in the 4 to 11 year age group was planned to be equally, equally randomized to either albuterol sulfate um, uh, or the low-dose BDA. In Mandala, among, in Mandala, among 3,132 patients who were randomized, 3,123 were qualified for the full analysis set divide, defined as all subjects who were randomly assigned and took any amount of BDA and these subjects were composed of adults, adolescents, and children. As noted in the figure, um, the majority of patients were adults. So for high-dose BDA, uh, both adults and adolescents were enrolled with adults composing about 97% of the patients. Um, and there were 83 children enrolled uh, to receive low-dose BDA or um, albuterol. Uh, this is the result of the primary efficacy endpoint, uh, which is time to first exacerbation. Looking at the high-dose BDA group, the hazard ratio was 0.73 in comparing high-dose BDA versus albuterol sulfate favoring BDA, and the risk reduction was statistically significant, indicating a significant delay in time to first severe exacerbation. Descriptively, uh, looking at the um, number of subjects with severe exacerbations, the proportion of subjects with the severe exacerbation was 6% lower for high-dose BDA group compared to the albuterol group. Looking at low-dose BDA, the, high, the uh, hazard ratio was 0.83 in comparing low-dose BDA to albuterol favoring BDA. However, the reduction was marginal with a p-value of 0.041 and with a 3% difference in the proportion of subjects with the severe exacerbation. Of note, the low-dose BDA efficacy comparison included children 4 to 11 years of, old, uh, of age, increasing the sample size um, uh, for the uh, low-dose group in albuterol. Uh, the type 1 error for these comparisons was controlled under Hochberg's step-up method, which I'll uh, discuss in a second. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve for the full analysis set, looking at the cumulative probability of severe exacerbation on the y-axis over time from randomization on the x-axis. The red curve represents the high-dose BDA group. The purple cur curve represents the low-dose BDA group, and the blue curve represents the albuterol group. As you can see, there's separation of the red curve from the albuterol uh, blue curve uh, from the beginning in demonstrating consistently lower cumulative probability of a severe exacerbation throughout the study duration. Looking at secondary endpoints, uh, there were several clinically meaningful secondary efficacy endpoints that were included in the primary analysis. The endpoints listed in the table are under the order defined by a pre-specified hierarchical testing procedure to control type 1 error rate. 
for each secondary endpoint, uh, it was evaluated looking at high dose followed by low dose. So for annualized severe exacerbation rate, the rate ratio was 0.76 for high dose BDA compared to albuterol favoring BDA, and the reduction was statistically significant. For low dose BDA, uh, the rate ratio was 0.8, which also was statistically significant. Moving on to total annualized dose of systemic corticosteroid uh, uh, use, the results showed that the mean use of systemic corticosteroid was 33.4% lower for the high-dose BDA group compared with the albuterol group, and the difference was statistically significant. However, for the low-dose BDA group, although the mean use of systemic corticosteroid was 25% lower in the BDA arm, the result was not statistically significant. And according to the type 1 air rate control plan, the evaluation for the rest of the endpoints was considered exploratory. And finally, this fourth plot summarizes the results of the primary endpoint by age-based subgroups. The uh, Blue dots here represent high-dose BDA, the red dots low-dose BDA. Um, while the hazard ratio for time to first exacerbation favors BDA in the overall population and in the subgroup greater than 18, for both low and high-dose, uh, for both uh, low and high-dose BDA, point estimates for the proposed doses for uh, 12 to less than 18 and 4 to less than 12 subgroups demonstrate point estimates that favor albuterol sulfate over BDA. However, since the confidence intervals were wide due to small sample size and included the null value of 1, these results are not statistically reliable. So one of the major uh, points for discussion today uh, will be uh, extrapolation. In order to support efficacy in pediatric subjects, Bayesian analyses were used to understand the amount of adult information needed in the pediatric analyses to demonstrate efficacy. One possible decision rule for concluding a statistically significant treatment effect of BDA in the pediatric subgroups is evaluating whether the 95% credible interval excludes the null value of hazard ratio equal to 1. Uh, I'm, I will show you the results of Bayesian borrowing approach conducted by the agency using a robust mixture prior approach, but note that the applicant used a, a different approach, um, but we note that the findings from these methods overall were consistent. So shown in this figure is the Bayesian analysis borrowing data for high-dose BDA in adolescents 12 to 17 years of age. This table shows that in order to obtain a hazard ratio less than 1, as shown here, the number of borrowed adult events would be 95. And that correlates with the percentage of total events from adults being 84.8%. To derive a statistically significant effect of high-dose BDA in this age group with an upper 95% credible limit less than 1, approximately, approximately 96% of the total events in the analysis would need to be borrowed from adults. So what this demonstrates is that in the adolescent age range, a high degree of Bayesian borrowing greater than 95% would be required to achieve meaningful results. Similarly, here's the Bayesian analysis borrowing adult data uh, for low-dose BDA in children 4 to 11, again using a robust mixture prior approach conducted by the agency. This table shows that to obtain a mean hazard ratio less than 1, approximately 89% of the total events in the analysis would need to be borrowed from adults and adolescents. To derive a statistically significant effect of low-dose BDA in the 4 to 11 year age range with an upper 95% credible limit less than 1, approximately 96% of total events in the analysis would need to be borrowed from adults and adolescents. 
again demonstrating that a high degree of Bayesian borrowing is required to achieve meaningful results. As a result, the concept of pediatric extrapolation will be central to today's dis discussion. Pediatric extrapolation can extend what we understand about a drug in the adult population to pediatric subjects based upon careful clinical and pharmacologic considerations. Thus, it can help reduce the burden of pediatric data requirements for drug development programs. The framework shown on the left is from the recent FDA guidance on pediatric extrapolation that shows the framework uh, with these arrows um, uh, on the red end. Um, it, it looks at similarity in disease and response to treatment between reference and target pediatric population. On the left, uh, it refers to the disease as being different in response to treatment being different. On the right, as you get to the green area, there's sufficient evidence that the same disease in response to treatment. Similarly, we look at the evidence of support. Uh, on the left in the red area, no data or large gaps in knowledge. And on the right, we have high quality data with high confidence um, to extrapolate a, a significant amount of data. So in this case, where a high degree of extrapolation is needed, it's appropriate based on this model if the disease is the same in adult and pediatric patients, if the response to treatment is the same in adult and pediatric patients, there's high confidence in evidence, and there are no significant knowledge gaps. Uh, and we are asking the advisory committee uh, to uh, discuss um, uh, these aspects of the available data uh, to help assess whether extrapolation is appropriate and the degree of extrapolation that is appropriate. Uh, the safety uh, database, uh, this summarizes the, the size of the safety database, which is primarily for Mandala. Uh, with uh, over 3,000 patients, 1,000 patients from Denali. And just to point out in red, uh, the number of patients in the four to less than 12 age range is small at 93, and 12 to less than 18, 125 patients. Since Mandela use was an event-driven variable duration trial in which the investigative product was used as needed, it's important to understand drug use patterns. On average, as shown in the second column, adults were enrolled in the treatment period for longer than adolescents or children, a function of late randomization of pediatric subjects relative to the primary completion date. This means that a smaller proportion of the pediatric sample size accrues up to 24 weeks of data as demonstrated in the third column, where 88% of, of the overall uh, analysis set um, received greater than or equal to 24 weeks of treatment compared to 70% and 66% in, in uh, the 4 to 11 age range. And in the last column, uh, we see that the mean and median number of daily inhalations was not only relatively balanced between randomized treatment arms, but also across age groups. Of note, children 4 to 11 reported a greater proportion of days without any investigative product at 45% compared to 25% in the total population. Regarding overuse of investigational product, this was a rare event with less than 1% of study subjects including one adolescent and two children using greater than 12 inhalations on more than two consecutive days. In conclusion, these data suggest that BDA overuse was not a frequent event during the Mandela study period, and that use patterns across randomized treatment arms, as well as across age cohorts, were similar. And we focus on ICS-related uh, adverse events. Uh, we analyzed both local and systemic ICS-related uh, adverse events. For local, the incidence was low and bounced across treatment arms. Oral candidiasis occurred more in the BDA arm than albuterol, albuterol arm, as would be expected. 
Looking at systemic adverse events, the incidence was low and balanced across treatment arms. For the pediatric population, we note that there's a small sample size and duration of exposure. Overall, the incidence of both local and systemic adverse events was low, and there was no significant pattern by age group. So just to summarize uh, efficacy results, in the Mandala study, the primary efficacy endpoint was met and supported by secondary endpoints. Results in adults greater than 18 are statistically significant, but the results in the two pediatric age groups, 4 to less than 12 and 12 to less than 18, are uncertain. There are wide confidence intervals due to the small sample size, with the upper bound exceeding 1. A high degree of Bayesian borrowing would be required to achieve meaningful results. Denali uh, uh, met the dual primary efficacy endpoints, and this satisfied the combination rule. In terms of safety, the strengths of safety, the adult safety database was adequate for review. Use of greater than 12 inhalations of BDA was not a significant issue during the study period. No new signals were identified, and the adverse event pattern was consistent with the well-characterized risk of ICS in SABA. Background ICS was also associated with the risk of IC, ICS-related adverse events. Areas of uncertainty in the safety data include the scope of the pediatric data, which is limited in size and duration of exposure. The data does not account for potential overuse in the real world. And long-term effects are unknown, uh, for example, growth, bone density, and others. So, for the discussions of the advisory committee, uh, the forest plot demonstrated here um, identifies the areas of uncertainty. Um, of central importance for the committee discussion, uh, we, we note that the um, efficacy results for the adolescent population, both high and low dose, are inconclusive, and for the 4 to 12 year age range with low dose BDA, is inconclusive. Uh, <clears throat> regulatory considerations specific for pediatric development for BDA, the applicant proposed enrollment of subjects down to six years of age and, and older. And we recommended expansion down to four years of age and older based on experience with budesonide and albuterol in, in this age group. The agency recommended a Bayesian borrowing approach, but no agreement on the degree of borrowing or statistical plan uh, was made. In terms of precedent, inhaled products are locally acting. Extrapolation of efficacy based on pharmacokinetic data is not appropriate. Typically, adolescents are enrolled in adult efficacy trials with subsequent dedicated trials in younger children. The division has leveraged some degree of extrapolation in the past. However, unique things here, the BDA program is a novel comb combination, it's a novel indication for prevention of severe exacerbations, and it's a novel intended use. In terms of precedent, uh, generally areas of extrapolation have been with established indications uh, for either the drug or drug class, so this would be um, uh, this would be unique. And, and again, uh, I show you the criteria uh, that should be considered in uh, determining whether extrapolation is appropriate in the level of, of, of extrapolation. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll close with. An initial table looking at benefit risk summary by age group. So for the greater than or equal to 18 years of age subgroup, both pivotal trials met the FDA agreed upon primary endpoints. BDA high dose demonstrated benefit in reducing severe exacerbations and reducing systemic corticosteroid use. In terms of risk, there were no new signals identified. And labeling routine pharmacovigilance should be able to manage uh, any uh, uh, risk from the product. Areas of uncertainty, it's a novel indication in intended use. 
the effects on asthma control and quality of life were not significant. And then ICS-related adverse events may be different uh, with real-world use. In the 12 to 18-year age range, the efficacy data is for the high-dose uh, BDA is inconclusive. Again, in terms of risk, there are no new ad signals identified. But based on the inconclusive results, extrapolation of data from the adult population would be needed uh, in an area of uncertainty that we're asking the advisory committee to help uh, uh, provide feedback on is what degree of extrapolation from adult data would be appropriate. The scope of the safety data database is small and long-term risks are not captured. Finally, in the four to less than 12-year age range, the efficacy was inconclusive for the low-dose BDA. Again, there were no new signals identified for adverse events. And the appropriate degree of extrapolation for this age group may differ from that for the 12 to 18-year age range. And again, we would like the advisory committee to provide feedback on that. Scope of the safety database was small and long-term risks were not captured. So we're going to ask this afternoon for the advisory committee to discuss the data to support the efficacy of six-dose combination budesonide and albuterol, or BDA, for the asthmated treatment, bronchoconstriction for prevention of exacerbation in patients four years of age and older. And we're going to ask specifically for children 4 to less than 12 and 12 to less than 18 if extrapolation of adult data to pediatric subjects is appropriate, and if so, discuss the appropriate degrees of extrapolation. We're going to ask the committee to discuss any potential safety concerns, particularly for children, and there will be voting questions on the benefit risk assessment for use of BDA for the uh, proposed indication in patients greater than or equal to 18 years of age, 12 to less than 18 years of age, and 4 to less than 12 years of age. Uh, so I'll conclude uh, the agency's presentation with this and uh, turn it over to Dr. Ayo. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I know we are pretty close to um, our noontime break for lunch. I was going to ask the committee if they'd be willing to go have discussions for about 15 minutes uh, into our lunch break, and then um, if there are additional questions, we can um, uh, re, um, you know, re-engage after the, um, the open public hearing uh, session. <clears throat> if that's okay with everyone, um, if there's any dissent, please let me know. Um, but um, in the absence of that, can I ask for any uh, clarifying um, questions uh, for the FDA? Please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question, and remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon after you've asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your questions to a specific person if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and end your follow-up question with, that's all for my questions, so that we can move on to the next panel member. So let me go ahead and open it up for um, discussion. Um, Ms. Oster, uh, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. This is Randy Oster, and my question is for uh, Kelly Stone. And I would like to know, is there precedent with the FDA when we need to go and use data of up to 478 people, do we look at that from a perspective of race or location to tie back. And the reason for this question is the data that was given to us is that 75% um, death rate is higher for black than white, yet the data that we were given in the studies only showed 13% uh, of the people were black. And therefore, I just want to make sure that if we were to choose to ex extrapolate data, there is a correlation between locations.
Thank you. I am I'm sorry, this, this is Kelly Stone, FDA. So thank you for that question. So I, I just want to make sure I understand your question. You're, you're asking about whether the adult population from which the data would be extrapolated is represented, representative of the general population? Is, is that your so, question? So the, right. The concern is, or, or the, I, I just want to um, identify as part of the process is that we correlate where we're extrapolating the data from so that we're not, we're not mixing uh, from one population to the other when the data has shown that it is um, not necessarily equal based on what has been presented yeah. in our, what was given to us. So, so we do look at, sub, so in our, our analysis as we're reviewing the data from these studies, we do look carefully at that. So I, I can't give you any specifics right now. Uh, but we do consider those factors in, in our analysis. Thank you. Right. Dr. Stoller? Uh, yeah. Yes, this is Jamie Stoller, a uh, question for Dr. Stone. And it, it regards uh, precedent with regard to Bayesian extrapolation. Um, I understand that this is a unique indication, and you've, you've made that very clear. My question is, in instances when you have actually used pediatric ex extrapolation, has there ever been an instance in which the magnitude of the extrapolation has been as big as your analysis suggests, the, the, you know, more than 85, 90 percent of the data? What, what's been the magnitude of extrapolation that's been acceptable to the agency as evidence of pediatric extrapolation? I'll stop there. Hey, this, this is Kelly Sun, FDA again. So um, if, if I understand your, your question, are, are there, is there precedence for full extrapolation of efficacy data from adults to children? And the answer to that would be yes. Um, so for products where PK matching is available, and we think that the, um, the disease is the same between the age groups, uh, full extrapolation can be used in those cases. So, you know, certainly there are examples of, of full extra extrapolation of data. Um, this is a little bit more challenging in that it's a locally acting product and you can't use PK uh, for matching. So, um, you know, so the, 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 the answer to your question is yes, there are examples, uh, but for inhaled products, the considerations are, are a little bit um, different and a little bit more challenging. Thank you. That completes my question. Thank you. Dr. Greenberger? Um, Thank you. This is a point of clarification for slide nine. This has to do with the fact that the way I understand it, we're, the investigational product is a single device with two medications. And we're adding an inhaled steroid SABA to either an inhaled steroid LABA or an inhaled steroid. And I just wanted to clarify that. So we're on the same page. Or am I not understanding it? Uh, yeah. So it it it. Uh, uh, this is Kelly. So FDA again. So it's on top of background therapy. So they continue their background therapy, and any time they would use a reliever medication, they would use the combined um, ICS saba. I, I I don't know if that's your question, Dr. Greenberger. I, I I don't I don't I just it was how it's presented on the slide that I think could be confusing because this is a single product with two medications in it. I I, I apologize for that that confusion. Mm -hmm. The other point I wanted to make is regarding the Trexa study, the data are from the U.S. the way in the, it's presented in the article. And I think that they used uh, two different inhalers 
and correct me if I'm wrong, as opposed to this investigational product, which is a single unit. Uh, I, yeah, so I, I, I don't know the, the answer to that um, off the top of my head, Dr. Greenberger. Uh, we we're certainly happy to defer that question to the applicant. Uh, at Piper AstraZeneca, I think I can clarify that in Trek, so yes, you're, you're correct. It was two inhalers, beclomethazone and albuterol, and patients were instru uh, instructed to take a dose of the beclomethazone at the same time as they took a dose of albuterol. So in that instance, it was uh, two inhalers. I used the example as uh, the print to show the principle of the combined rescue preparation being effective compared to albuterol. And to be clear, BDA is indeed a fixed dose combination product in a single inhaler of budesonide and albuterol. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if no further follow-up, um, Dr. May? I have a question for Dr. Stone. Um, in the summary slides, you indicated that uh, the results for the kids are inconclusive and that the long-term risks are unknown. Uh, but wouldn't that be uh, expected for the study, given the small sample size for this? And um, that's my first question. And then after that, I have one more. Uh, so, so yes, we agree with, 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 with that statement. OK. Um, so the other question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I would disagree like, that it would be expected with the small sample okay. size. And the design, yes. Um, the other question that I have is, uh, would it be possible to bring up Table 7 of the FDA briefing document? That's the event rates in each of the subgroups. If not, I can um, repeat from the table uh, the numbers that I'm looking at and that I have a question about. I apologize. We're, we're checking to see if we can pull up that figure. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe maybe I should just get started, and then if you bring it up, that would be great. And if not, um, that's fine, too. So um, as I think was pointed out previously, the number of events in the younger age groups are very, very, relatively small. I was struck by the amount of borrowing that is necessary to reverse the results in some sense uh, that were seen for the kids. Nevertheless, the uh, rate of events in the 12 to 18 um, age group is 9 out of 34, which is 26.5%, which happens to be almost exactly the event rate that is seen in the adults in the AS group. Um, so number one, I was uh, positively um, struck by that the event rate in that group is not higher, uh, but the numbers are really small. So the AS group for the younger age group from 12 to 18 has an event rate of 7 out of 34, which is 20.6%. So our best estimate for the background rate of events is uh, for the AS group, the 26.4% that is seen in the adults. So I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, even though a large amount of Bayesian borrowing is required to reverse the results, I think it would take only two events in the um, 12 to 18 age group to result in a, in a null effect. And I know that based on hazard rate ratios, it's a little bit more complicated than just the percent of events, but it, it is just that we are talking about very small numbers here. And, and uh, yes, it, it, we, we see what we see, and, and that's in the opposite direction. But I, if I'm not mistaken, um, and that would be maybe a question for the statistician, um, in general, approximately only two events would have to be different two additional events in the AA group for the kids, for the 12 to 18 age group, uh, or more, or two events less in the um, a high dose group to result in a hazard ratio that is uh, approximately one. Am I correct on that? This is Young Men Kim, uh, FDA. So we, we 
agree with your observation. So based on small sample size and very uh, rare events, so uh, maybe one or two events in the opposite direction maybe change the, uh, the estimate direction. So th th that means there's a lot of, you know, uh, the uncertainty in this estimate, in this pediatric population. Yes, thank you. And that was it from my end. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cabana. Hi, this is Dr. Cabana. Dr. Stone, this builds on Dr. May's question. This is slide 11 of your presentation on the sample size calculation. So this sample size calculation, it, it's been described, well, the sample size for adolescents has been described as small, but looking at this slide, it looked like 1,000 patients were supposed to be recruited over the age of 12. I guess, was there any assumptions made about what the distribution of adults and adolescents would be, or were they all just lumped together, and it was just bad luck that we only ended up with 90 adolescents? Because if, if you look at the original sample size calculation, it looks like there could have been many more adolescents. And was there any assumption about how the recruitment would go and what the sample size should have been when doing the sample size calculation? It, it seems like they were just all lumped together. Thanks for clarifying. Hi, uh, this is a uh, primary uh, statistical reviewer, Tony. Uh, can so yeah, uh, thousand patients per per group was planned for um, adolescent and adult other patients combined, and there were no specific plan um, how much from each adolescent, adolescent or adult uh, patient to be recruited at, at the design stage. So it turns out that only a small portion of adolescents from, from the planned population uh, sample size was, was recruited in Mandala trial. So, so just to clarify two points, this was never really powered for it. The way this was structured, it was never really powered for a specific analysis for adolescent subjects between 12 and 18. Number two, it seems like it was assumed that all these patients these 1,000 patients would be lumped together, adults and adolescent subjects. So there was never any planned a priori analysis of adolescent patients between 12 and 18 separately. Thank you. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. That explains, um, that, that helps explain why the distribution was this way. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Um, why don't we uh, take the last question, um, uh, clarifying question from uh, Dr. Dykwitz. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, we've been discussing uh, not only in this presentation, but the sponsor's presentation extrapolation of data in the pediatric and adolescent group um, from budesonide promoterol uh, to the current uh, product under consideration, budesonide albuterol. Now, of course, an assumption would be that the inhaled corticosteroid component of both products is responsible for the bulk of the exacerbation risk reduction. But the question that I'm wrestling with, and I wonder whether the agency has considered this, is we are looking at the difference between a product that has a long-acting beta agonist versus a short-acting beta agonist, and the possibility that the short-acting beta agonist nature plays some role in the protective um, effect of the combination product. So my, my specific question is whether the agency has similar or any other additional reservations about the extrapolation of budesonide from motorol data uh, to budesonide albuterol. Thank you. 
Hi, this is Dr. Seymour, uh, the Division Director. Um, thank you for that question. You know, I think we're we're really focusing on this development program. Um, you know, with inhaled products, they're each unique. They have unique delivery, um, and so we're not necessarily going to be able to glean a whole lot from uh, the literature for the ICS LABA to directly inform uh, the efficacy data for this product. So, you know, it, it's it's important context to understand, but um, I don't know that we can leverage it for the efficacy and extrapolation in this program. Thank you. No questions. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, we'll now take a, a lunch break. Um, we will convene, and I apologize for running us a little bit long for that, but we will convene at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, panel members, please remember that there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during the lunch break. Additionally, you should uh, plan to rejoin around uh, 12.45 Eastern to ensure that you are connected before we convene at 1 p.m. Thank you very much. We'll see you shortly.
This is David O. I, I hope everyone had a, an enjoyable lunch. I think we should go ahead and get started again. In the open public hearing session, both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it's important to understand the context of the individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, uh, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement, to advise the committee of any financial relationship. Yes, it is on. Oh, here we go. This is Takiya speaking. For me, Monitor, to please mute your lines, your phone. We are not speaking. Thank you. Thank you. I'll continue. For this reason, the FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your oral or written statement, to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the sponsor, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include sponsored payments for your travel, lodging, or other expenses in connection with your participation in the meeting. Likewise, the FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and this committee places great importance in the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency with this committee and this committee in the consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. One of our goals for today is for this public open, this open public hearing to be conducted in a fair and open way where every participant is listened to carefully, treated with dignity, courtesy, and respect. Therefore, Please speak only when recognized by the chairperson. Thank you for your cooperation. Speaker number one, your audio is now connected. Uh, will speaker number one begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michelle Dickens. I am a nurse practitioner and a certified asthma educator. I work in Springfield, Missouri for a hospital system called Cox Health. Um, for my disclosures, I am a, a speaker for AstraZeneca for severe asthma, and I have participated in the advisory board um, for this product. I've also in the past participated um, as an advisory board member for um, a different company, Boehringer Ingelheim. So in the course of evaluating this application, uh, you will be presented with data from several clinical trials. However, my role today is to take you out of the clinical trial and into the clinic. Um, I hinted at this in my written comment, but I felt it warranted a few minutes to give you a glimpse of the reality of asthma care from the trenches. For the past 12 years, I have worked as a nurse practitioner and asthma educator in an asthma specialty clinic. My days are spent in direct patient care. I counsel asthma patients of all ages about how to manage their disease, and I prescribe medication therapies. I consider myself to be skilled at explaining the need for controller medicines, the risk of oral steroids, and the importance of trigger avoidance. And I've been told by patients and students that I'm a good educator. And I have the luxury of spending at least 20 to 30 minutes with each patient, educating them about their disease. But at the end of the day, am I successful? Judging by the refill patterns of my patients for their asthma controller medicines, I'm better than the average. Unfortunately, that might not be saying much because the average refill rate is only about 35%, a solid F if we were getting graded as a community. Now let's think back to my days in primary care. I spent 10 years in family practice in a rural health clinic. It's where I developed my passion for asthma care. In a 15-minute visit, I was expected to address my patient's hypertension, diabetes, and their asthma. Is it any wonder that even the most basic message about what it means to have good asthma control or how to use the asthma medications gets lost or never addressed? This is the challenge we face in asthma care. While I, while I may see the most severe asthmatics in my specialty clinic, the majority of those so-called mild patients are being managed in the primary care setting. But are they really mild or just underestimated? 
because now we know that these mild asthmatics have exacerbations at a rate similar to my severe ones. Over half of the mild asthmatics will have a significant flare-up in the next year, and clearly we are failing our asthma patients. However, we're not failing in asthma care because we have shortages of good medicines or well-meaning healthcare providers. We are failing because we have refused to accept the reality of how patients treat their asthma. It's time for a reality check about asthma. Our enemy is a chronic disease that by nature waxes and wanes over time. Despite our best efforts to educate patients on the importance of taking a controller even when they're feeling well, they simply don't do it. We blame the patient, labeling them non-compliant. Instead, we should blame ourselves for being non-observant. The 2020 NAEPP asthma guidelines update specifically addresses the use of short-acting bronchodilators and inhaled steroids uh, for as-needed combined therapy in mild asthmatics as an alternative to the traditional regimen of daily ICS and as-needed SABA. And I'm a big supporter of this approach, and I've been trying to implement it for my appropriate patients in my practice. However, this requires the patient to use two different inhalers during each dose. It sounds simple enough, but in the real world, I'm finding that patients get confused about the plan, and they often are reverting back to just using the SABA because it gives quick relief. Once again, we would label these patients as non-compliant with our present therapy. We need a new treatment paradigm, one that is patient-centered, and that is what this new inhaler can do for us. These medicines are not new. We've had them in our toolbox for decades, but now we're thinking outside the box, using an innovative approach to take the tried and true medications in our arsenal and rethink about how best to use them. This inhaler tailors our treatment to match the way that patients behave in the real world instead of expecting them to conform to our ideas. Patients will continue to reach for their short-acting beta agonists for rescue. If we replace it with the combination of a short-acting beta agonist and inhaled corticosteroid, we address both the symptoms and the underlying inflammation. It is a simple but elegant solution that is a win for everyone. The patient gets quick relief while we succeed at treating the airway inflammation. And as you've heard from the clinical trial data, this reduces exacerbations. This could be our new reality where we translate the success of a clinical trial into success in my clinic. Thank you very much for allowing me to present. Thank you very much. The open public hearing portion of this meeting is now concluded. We will no longer take comments from the audience. The committee will now turn its attention to address the task at hand, the careful consideration of the data before the committee, as well as the public comments. We have, <clears throat> we will now take an opportunity um, to take any remaining clarifying questions. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question, and remember to put your hand down after you've asked the question. Please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to the specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. As a gentle reminder, it would be helpful to acknowledge um, the end of your question with a thank you. and end of your follow-up question with, that is all for my questions, so that we can move on to the next panel member. We'll start with Dr. Kim. Edwin Kim, University of North Carolina. This is a question for Dr. Stone. Um, if I'm understanding the uh, proposal, they, uh, the company is looking to um, advocate for the high-dose regimen for adults. And my question comes back to the children. And is there a precedent to extrapolating data to, I guess, what I'm going to call sort of a secondary outcome, the lower dose? Uh, of the, uh, that was analyzed versus the high dose, which is what's being proposed for adults? 
Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Seymour from FDA, the Division Director. So, um, you know, they have data that they've obtained uh, in the pediatric 4 to 11 age group with the lower dose. And um, so I, I don't think we necessarily um, would be relying on extrapolation from the higher dose to the lower dose. Uh, I believe the lower dose was also studied in the adult um, population, and uh, there was success with that dose as well. So there is that information as well that we have in the adult population to look towards. This is Edwin Kim from uh, North Carolina again with a follow-up. Um, and where that question is coming from was, if I understood the data, there was benefit in the adults for both high and low dose regimens, although the higher dose seemed to have a stronger benefit. And um, representatives earlier had given arguments for why they studied the lower dose and not necessarily the higher dose. Um, and I, again, trying to just clarify when extrapolation, when borrowing of data is going to be done, is this borrowing from the lower dose uh, data accumulated in the adults, which seem to have lesser efficacy, or is there somehow, and, and this may show sort of um, maybe not um, being completely comfortable with uh, the sort of Bayesian borrowing concept. Thank you. This is Dr. C. Morgan. I, you know, I don't think I have much to add really other than um, they did study the lower dose in uh, the adult population. Just with, in, with inhaled corticosteroids in general, um, I would say that Typically, in the 4 to 11 age group, we do see the lower dose um, as the dose that's approved. Um, so there is sort of, you know, that historical information about the use of ICS in pediatric patients as well. Okay, and I think the sticking point for me is just the, the use of this as a rescue versus a controller, uh, but uh, understood. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hocking? Yes. Uh, Fernando Aguin, University of Colorado. Question for Dr. Kelly Stone or the biostatistical team. I know that there are several methods for Bayesian um, extrapolation or borrowing, and, and there's also the risk of potentially introducing biases and overinflating type 1 error. So since this is such a, at heart of the discussion, could you give us a little more information as to the methodology used for Bayesian uh, extrapolation? Hi, this is James Travis. I'm the lead statistician for uh, the pediatric and maternal health team. Um, we, I think we, <clears throat> I'd like to ask, ask uh, what particular type of information you're looking on, looking for on the method. Um, we, we provide additional information on the details in, in one of the appendi appendices in the briefing document, but I think there's a lot to look at and it would be helpful if you can uh, focus the, the question a little bit more. You know, you know the question whether it, depending on the methodology that you you use, you may end up with a different estimate or potentially uh, introducing biases, and that's just you know sort of a simple way to ask whether those were taken into consideration. Um, uh, I'm sorry, for sorry, go ahead. How, you know how how you know how do you select the data to borrow? Is that just done at random, for example? Do the rates of the historical data and the comparative data the same and things like that? Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it, thank you for your question. Yes, it, it, it's a general concern with using these methods. Uh, you, do, you do get uh, some kind of influence on the point estimates um, based on the proximity to between the prior mean and the, um, the observed mean. The mixture prior model tries to reduce it, it doesn't completely uh, eliminate the bias, and, and yeah, it, it's definitely a concern, but I think it, the advantage of, it, of this type of method is it, it allows us to kind of quantify the amount of borrowing, and I think that that, over, over, that compensates for the disadvantages in this case. Uh, 
and thank you for further questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carlson. Hello, um, this is Don Carlson, and I have a question for Dr. Stone, and it's really based on the discussion prior to lunch about the extrapolation. My understanding is that it was based on the adults in the Mandela trial, not any external studies. And then the second question was that when there was a recommendation to do the Bayesian methodology for extrapolation, was there any estimate? I know there was no agreement on um, the amount, but was there any estimate of what degree of extrapolation might be required given the small sample size? Uh, yes, this is Kelly Stone, FDA. So th there, there was a uh, discussion about using a Bayesian borrowing approach, um, but there, there, there was no discussion uh, about the amount of borrowing that would be appropriate. Um, and your first question, I think, had to do with whether the data would come only from the adult population in the study or from external data, if I understood correctly, and it would just be based on the adult data from the Mandala trial. Okay, thank you. I, that completes my question. Thank you. Ms. Oster? Oh, yes. Um, I just want to clarify that if we need 478 uh, borrowed adults to get to a 96% confidence level for the 4 to 12 year olds, that the 1,000 population that you had was adequate or um, is it in the ideal world you really are, um, would want to look for more people? So I, I think it's a very direct question is do we even have enough people in the sample size for the borrowing rate needed? Can I, can I ask a uh, follow-up? To, to whom is that question directed? Oh, Dr. Stone. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Kelly Stone for the FDA. I'm sorry for the uh, d delay on muting. So, um, we, we think that there's enough data, adult data from the Mandela trial to allow extrapolation if it was determined that it was appropriate. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we, we do think that there is sufficient data amongst the adult population in the study to extrapolate if that was deemed to be appropriate. And that's across demographics as well? Uh, a, a, across demographics as well, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tracy? Uh, Dr. Dr. Tracy here. I'm not exactly sure who the, I would direct this to, um, but, you know, we talked about this being, you know, a novel indication and a novel, not a novel um, uh, indication. But, you know, the, the products themselves really are not that novel. They've been around for a long time. There's a long history of clinical and regulatory background to support that. I was just wondering if, um, is there anything in particular when you combine these two agents within a single uh, dosing device that, that, that warrants additional consideration? Um, and again, I'm not sure exactly who that would go to, but um, I'm assuming it's safer and we've looked at the safety stuff, but is there any other things we need to be thinking about? Thank you. Uh, Ed Piper, AstraZeneca, may I offer a common, uh, comment to uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, please, please go ahead. Hi, hi this is Yuen Zhao Ren, uh, the clinical pharmacology team leader from FDA. So, yeah, usually uh, from clinical farm perspective, um, if you combine two active ingredients into one inhaler or one de inhalation device, we, from us, we also ask uh, applicants to do a kind of drug-drug interaction study to see if um, at least at the systemic exposure level, if uh, one drug or one active ingredient can affect uh, the system PK of the other one. So 
does that answer your question? That, yeah, thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. No, uh, no follow-on questions either. Great. Um, no additional comments. Um, <clears throat> let's go to uh, Dr. Uh, Huntsberger. Uh, yes, this is Sally Huntsberger. So this is directed at, for the FDA. So I just wanted to understand a little bit more what the goals or objectives were of the FDA when they asked for the company to include younger kids um, but allowed such a small sample size. So was it really just to get some safety information? Be because clearly with that small sample size, you won't get any efficacy information. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand kind of statistically or, or what you were thinking when you asked for these, these participants to be included. So this is Dr. Seymour. I'll, I'll try and address your question. Um, you know, the, this program dates back a number of years, and I think when we initially had conversations with the sponsor about the development program, uh, they initially were proposing to do a trial, probably Mandala-like, that was going to be in, in patients 12 years of age and older. And we sort of questioned what the plan was for their pediatric program, and I don't think at that time they'd really developed one yet. And given, you know, the familiarity with these moieties and the idea of how this product would be used, um, you know, at that time we said, why don't you consider conducting the trial in the entire age group? Um, and so I think they took that advice and came back with a, a proposal. And um, ultimately, uh, we did agree to what the applicant proposed in terms of the sample size in uh, the 12 and older, 12 to 18, and 4 to 11 years of age. You know, but at that time, I don't think we fully appreciated um, the difference in this development program compared to other asthma products which, um, thinking about it, other asthma programs are generally looking at FEV1 uh, as a continuous endpoint. And so this power, or this number of patients with a continuous endpoint, you know, might have been a sufficient number of patients um, to sort of have a little bit more statistical confidence. But here, I don't know that we would have anticipated that we would be looking at a handful of events in 4 to 11 years of age and 11, um, 12 to 18 years of age to really be making a decision on. So in hindsight, you know, maybe having more data in these age groups would have been a good idea, but um, this is a novel program, um, and I think including patients from four years of age and older is not something we've typically done with our development programs, but it stems back to really some familiarity with these moieties and dosing that we already knew and knew that they were effective for other uses in asthma. So, um, you know, this is the data we have, um, and we have to make a decision about this, and it's a really, I think, a good opportunity to take the question of extrapolation in asthma and adolescents and children 4 to 11 years of age to you to, to get your opinion on it, whether this is enough data or not. Um, to, you know, support a, a favorable benefit risk. Thank you. That's very helpful. Chair, Ed Barbara Seneca, may I make a comment building on uh, uh, Dr. Seymour's point, please? Yes. Please go ahead. Listening to, to Dr. Seymour that one of the uh, pieces of data we have that might be helpful that we haven't shared yet is the uh, what we learned about lung function and change in lung function in the Mandala study in the two populations of interest. So I'm just going to briefly pass you to Dr. Church just to show you uh, two slides on, on that data, which might be relevant. Thank you. Allison Church, AstraZeneca, slide up. So lung function was measured at weeks 12 and 24 and was an exploratory endpoint in the overall population. And we did a post hoc analysis in the adolescent population. Slide up. Um, all right, so I'll just describe the data. So at week 12, we saw a 202 uh, milliliter improvement in FEV1 
with the lower dose of BDA, the 8180, versus albuterol with a p-value of 0 0.02. At week 24, that value was 196 with a p-value of 0 0.048. For the BDA 160, 180 dose versus albuterol, we saw an improvement of 70 ml with a p-value of 0 0.41. And at week 24, the improvement was 149 ml with a p-value of 0 0.14. We also have the uh, additional lung function data in children. <clears throat> Again, looking at the lung function at week 24, and week 12, uh, we saw an improvement of 131 milliliters with a p-value of 0 0.104, and at week 24 of 183 with a p-value of 0 0.056. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's helpful to share the uh, lung function data that we hadn't previously shared, given that is a highly relevant endpoint uh, in these uh, subpopulations. Thank you. Any follow-up, um, Dr. Hudsberger? Uh, no, thank you. That was very helpful. Appreciate it. Yes, great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jones? Yes, um, Bridget Jones. Um, I had a question. I think um, it's for the sponsor um, about the proposed dosing regimen. Um, so you propose um, Two, inhal two inhalations of 80, 90, and um, 12 or greater, and two inhalations of 40, 90, um, and 4 to 12, not to exceed six doses in 24 hours. Um, can you talk about how you came up with the maximum 24-hour um, um, cumulative um, dose? Ed Piper, AstraZeneca. Um, yes, the, the maximum dosing uh, that we chose is uh, consistent with the albuterol uh, label, which allows for uh, uh, 12 doses in a 24-hour period. Uh, and that was what we studied in the Mandala trial. Uh, that was the maximum dose we advised that patients should take. And as you've seen from uh, the data I showed you on uh, the pattern of use, that was a dose that was used very infrequently, presumably at the time of a worsening or in the run-up to, to an exacerbation. Uh, so yes, it was based on the albuterol data and the existing label uh, and was uh, studied in Mandala. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Ms. Oster? Yes. Um, We've been talking about age and not weight or size. And we all know, unlike adults that uh, stay the same size, that um, children are growing. Can you comment on the limitations of age and the potential of uh, incorrect dosing because of their weight and size and how that was looked at? And that would be a question for the sponsor. Ed Piper, AstraZeneca. And this is an inhaled uh, medicine, so the um, site of action is local in the lungs, and so uh, weight is less of a concern than it would be for a drug with uh, systemic bioavailability. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow-up? If not, um, <clears throat> um, Dr. Weinberg from Sponsor. Uh, no, thank you, sir. Okay, very good. Um, uh, Dr. Schwartzox? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Schwartzox. Uh, yes, I'm the patient representative, Dr. Schwartzox, so I have questions that are a little bit different from the doctors. I would like to see some data relating to the moderate to severe side effects and or adverse events in the pediatric patients. I'm concerned about the difference in the safety risk with those from the um, young children compared to the adolescents. Ed Piper, AstraZeneca, I'm going to pass you to our pediatric lead, uh, Dr. Church, who will take you through uh, some of the adverse event data observed in the trial in pediatrics and adolescents. 
Dr. Church. Allison Church, AstraZeneca. So for adolescents, no AE preferred term was reported by more than two subjects in any treatment group. The adverse events reported were consistent with those expected in a population of adolescents with asthma. There were no AEs leading to discontinuation of treatment, nor AEs considered related to investigational product reported in adolescents. In children, the only AE preferred term that was reported by more than two subjects in any treatment group was for influenza which was reported by three subjects in the albuterol group and two in the BDA-8180 group. One patient in the BDA-8180 group discontinued treatment due to AEs of, or adverse events of oral pharyngeal pain and cough, and two subjects reported adverse events considered related uh, in the BDA-8180 group. One patient reported an adverse event of cough and the other an adverse event of cough and pharyngitis that were considered related by the investigator. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question then about that? We do. Um, okay, in regards to um, uh, heart rate tachycardia, was that an issue? with any of the side effects? I know that it can be a problem um, with patients that can't take the albuterol on its own. At Piperacid, and again, no tachycardia was not an adverse event that we uh, observed during the trial. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have. Great. Um, let me ask, Dr. Hoquin, your hand is still up. Um, do you have an additional question? I'll take that silence as a no, and we'll go on to Dr. Cloutier. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Michelle Cloutier. I have a question related to uh, safety of the fixed combo in 4- to 12-year-olds. Um, when you look at the frequency uh, of doses, yeah, you, you pointed out the very large uh, percentage of children who did not use, uh, I think it was 40, 45% of children did not use a, um, any uh, dose of the rescue medication during the day. But the next most common were four puffs, or two to four puffs, which is one to two um, uh, inhalations per day. Did you look at all in terms of those two to four puffs? What number of those were related to prevention of exercise-induced bronchoconstriction? And the reason that I ask that is um, that Children often, the school-age children in particular, often use bronchodilator prior to recess, and many of them use uh, albuterol, for example, prior to sports. And it, um, it, is it possible that um, these children who have mild asthma, whose asthma is well-controlled, may be unnecessarily exposed to inhaled corticosteroid when they're using um, uh, when they're using protection uh, in terms of exercise, and I think that's a question for Dr. Piper. Ed Piper, AstraZeneca. Uh, thank you. And you're right, and just to to help uh, for the for the whole panel, the in the Mandala study, patients were permitted to take. Uh, BDA or albuterol in response to uh, uh, in response to symptoms as they would for a um, normal rescue. They were also permitted to take it uh, if they were aware that they were uh, at risk of bronchoconstriction from known triggers, particularly exercise. So when we look at the data that shows the pattern of use in uh, the 4 to 11 year old group, we have to look at that and recognize that there are two components to that, patients taking in response to symptoms and 
those taking it prophylactically. So we saw it as being quite reassuring data that uh, patients were not uh, overusing the product, uh, taking into account both those opportunities to use the product were available in the protocol. Uh, so we didn't, uh, we, we didn't have that concern. But just in follow-up to that, um, Dr. Piper, but, but how do you know that in these children, many of whom had many days that they wouldn't need any rescue medication, um, that they have very well-controlled asthma, and that, uh, but they're using it for exercise prophylaxis and don't actually need uh, the inhaled corticosteroid. And therefore, cumulative dose over the course of many, many years would be an unnecessary exposure for those children to ICS. Yeah, uh, at Piper AstraZeneca, uh, I think our concern was that for a rescue preparation, that we would expect that patients would ex would want to use the product in the same way that they use their existing rescue, and the concept of having a rescue inhaler like BDA uh, that was used both in response to symptoms and prophylactically, we would see would seem to be uh, appropriate. Uh, the concept that a patient would have to carry two different rescue inhalers, one albuterol and one BDA, uh, seems to us to be uh, overly complex. And as I said, looking at the pattern of use um, that included prophylactic use for exercise, we didn't see a concern around uh, the amount of product being used um, uh, as we uh, as I described earlier. So that was our perspective on, on the topic, but what you raise is clearly uh, relevant and, and appropriate to consider in the round. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, my question. I'm sorry, this is David O. Um, I dropped briefly. Um, I just wanted to check back. Um, Dr. Hunsberger? Yeah, sorry, Sally Hunsberger. I guess I did have one follow-up question to, to my original question. So the company presented some, what I understand is new data, and I guess I just wondered if the FDA had any comment on that data since we didn't see a slide on it. it was, the numbers were just quoted, and I'm wondering if they saw it and if you had any comments on that um, lung function data. Ed Piper, we'd, we'd be very willing to sorry, we'd be very willing to to share the data. We have a slide on it, but we don't have control of of the slide. So if if it was interest to the panel and you wanted to see the slides, we'd be happy to share share it with you. And and this is Kelly Sun from the uh, FDA. So we we have not seen this data, uh, so we can't comment on it. And it certainly hasn't been a consideration in our in our uh, evaluation of this program. This is new data to us. Thank you. We call, we call. Should we share the, share the data, Mr. Chair? Sure. Why don't you go ahead and share it? Okay, so I'll hand you to Dr. Church to share the data. Line up. This, yeah. this 
data was shared, as I understand it, in the submission documents in the um, modules that were submitted, and it should be in the CSR. This is the um, lung function data where I read out the numbers. Um, so again, this is in the adolescents at week 24 and at week, uh, week 12 on the top, week 24 on the bottom, with the 80-180 dose on top um, in the first row and the 160-180 dose in the second row. So again, as you can see, there were improvements um, in FEV1 with BDA 8180 compared to albuterol. Um, the the, the p-value was less than 0 0.05 for the 8180 dose comparisons, where that was not the case for the 160-180 dose. And next slide. I can also share the data in children. So at week 12, an improvement of 131 milliliters was observed, um, and at week 24, 183 milliliters, both of which were um, had p-values greater than 0 0.05. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. This is Any, Dr. Um, from the FDA. Can I make a comment on that? Yeah, please. You, you know, I, I think we would uh, ask the committee to consider uh, the utility or the usefulness of that uh, spirometry data uh, for the exacerbation endpoint. Uh, an indication here. Um, we do have a dedicated trial that looked at lung function with Denali, so we already have some assessment of lung function from these from this product. So, just uh, something to consider. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Stoller. Yeah, this is Jamie Stoller. Uh, with regard to the uh, recognizing the comments uh, about the spirometry data, a question for the sponsor. Um, as I looked quickly at the 12 to 18 data and the magnitude of effect, are you surprised that the magnitude effect was was smaller for the larger dose than than uh, than for the smaller dose? <laughs> Ed Piper, okay. Yeah, as we described before, um, the 80-180 and the 160-180 in adolescents uh, is not dose ordered. That is a surprise to us. Um, I think I gave you the reasons why we consider it to be actually the law of small number of patients and small number of events um, before the lunch break. And I, I think looking again at the overall data um, that is powerfully in support of the 160-180 dose in the overall patient population on the primary endpoint and all the secondary endpoints, I think we feel comfortable that uh, that is the right dose to be recommending uh, that uh, is considered for, uh, for adolescents as well. Thank you. Thank you. No, no follow-up, actually. Yeah. No, just no. Oh, it's sort of an editorial comment. You know, um, perhaps in anticipation of uh, responding to questions later, I mean, one of the things that troubles me in general is that, you know, the data really vacillate, um, you know, sometimes favorable, sometimes unfavorable, and it's, uh, it's sort of ascribed to small numbers, and the volatility of the data in small numbers is apparent. Um, I'll, I'll stop with that. Um, so uh, no further comment. Thank you, Dr. Stoller. Uh, Dr. Campana? I, I think Dr. Stoller asked the question I wanted to ask as well, too, about the small numbers. So it's also very troubling as well. If it's the law of small numbers, it seems like you, you just can't pick which small group that you like. So mm -hmm. um, no, that's just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hoquin? Yes, Fernando Olguin. I was just wondering for the sponsor, were both arms, the high and lower dose in adolescents, was there similar amount of exposure data in terms of like uh, data points that were included in the analysis? Is it possible that the dose in the lower dose, you had fewer data points in exacerbation wise or lung function treatment? Uh, 
uh, Ed Piper saying that. I don't believe that's the case. The, the, the number of uh, adolescents are similar between the treatment groups, um, and so I don't think that there is less data per se by, by dose group. Um, we stratified by age for the adolescents, so hence the equal number of uh, patients in the adolescent cohort, so I don't think that's a factor. Thank you. No further questions. Can I ask um, one last round uh, for the committee at large? Are there any more clarifying questions uh, for either the FDA or the or the sponsor? If not, then I think we can um, move on. Um, we will now proceed with the FDA charge to the committee from Dr. Kelly Stone. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, before we do that, uh, Dr. Stoller, do you still have your hand up or was that from the carryover? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm neglectful in not lowering my hand. No, no further questions. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Um, great. So we will now proceed to the FDA charge to the committee from Dr. Kelly Stone. Uh, th th thank you, Dr. Rao, oh, and, and, and I'd like to thank the committee and the applicant for the discussion up to this point. Um, just to reemphasize, BDA is a new combination product with budesonide and albuterol. It's a new indication, a new proposed indication to prevent regression to exacerbations, severe exacerbations, and it would be the first use of an ICS for reliever treatment. For the adolescent and, and pediat for, for the pediatric subgroup in general, there's great uncertainty in terms of the effect of this product for the intended use. And the focus of the discussion really comes back to where it's been, which is how comfortable um, it is um, or, or the members of the committee in extrapolating data. Um, what is the basis for extrapolation of that data? And we're particularly interested in whether um, sort of the, there's less uncertainty in the adolescent 12 and above group uh, compared to the four to less than 12 age group. So the, the, the questions that we're asking the committee to um, discuss, again, to help inform our analysis of this development program are, one, discuss the data to support the efficacy of the fixed dose combination for the uh, proposed indication uh, that's highlighted here, and in particular for adolescents 12 to less than 18 and young children 4 to less than 12, discuss if extrapolation of adult data to pediatric patients is appropriate based on, on the available data. And if so, discuss the appropriate degree of extrapolation in these age groups. And we're particularly interested in whether full extrapolation as would be needed here uh, would, would be appropriate based on available data. The second discussion point is to discuss the safety of BDA for the proposed indication discussing any specific pediatric concerns, and, and there have been some raised but, uh, in, in the discussion to this point, uh, but we'd like to hear if there are any additional safety considerations that would need to be considered, particularly for, uh, for the younger children. And then there are three voting questions that we're going to ask the committee to vote on. Uh, the first, do the data support a favorable benefit risk assessment for use of BDA? in patients greater than or equal to 18 years of age with asthma? And if not, we'd like to hear what additional data may be needed to support uh, that indication in that age group. Question four uh, is a, a voting question. Again, do the data support a favorable benefit risk assessment for BDA in patients 12 years of age to less than 18 years of age with asthma? And if not, what additional data are needed? And then finally, in the youngest age group, uh, four to less than 12 years of age, 
do the data support a favorable benefit risk assessment for the proposed indication? And if not, what additional data would be, uh, would be needed? Um, so we, we look forward to hearing um, discussion um, on the discussion questions as well as feedback on the voting questions. Um, and um, I will turn it over at this point uh, to Dr. Al. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Stone. The committee will now turn its attention to address the task at hand, the careful consideration of the data before the committee, as well as the public comments. We will now proceed with the questions to the committee and panel discussions. I would like to remind public observers that while this meeting is open for public observation, public attendees may not participate except at the specific request of the panel. After I read each question, we will pause for any questions or comments concerning its wording. Then we will open the question uh, to discussion. We will start with question one. Discuss the data to support the efficacy of fixed dose combination budesonide and albuterol sulfate meter dose inhaler, parent BDA, close parent, for the as needed treatment or prevention of bronchoconstriction and for the prevention of exacerbations in patients with asthma four years of age and older. For adolescents 12 to 18, and young children between 4 and 12 discuss if extrapolation of the adult data to pediatric subjects is appropriate, and if so, discuss the appropriate degree of extrapolation in these age groups. Are there any questions about the wording of the discussion question? If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now open the question to discussion. We'll start with Dr. Stoller. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. O. This is Jamie Stoller. Um, and, and I have a I have a predicate comment, and then really a question for my pediatric pulmonary colleagues uh, on the committee on the panel. Uh, the predicate comment is that you know the whole issue of, of of extrapolation is predicated on a couple of issues. One is the disease similarity, if you will, but but another dimension of it is the extant data, recognizing that the extant data from both Trexa and Stay don't exactly apply here. Different uh, a different um, beta agonist, uh, formoterol, um, rapid acting but long acting as opposed to albuterol. And as I read those studies, um, again, Trexa in uh, ages 5 to 18, stay in ages 4 to 11, you know, that uh, this was alluded to earlier, I believe, that the data are sort of conflicting. At least as I read it, Trexa on the primary outcome measure, which was time to first exacerbation, not treatment failure as was shown, but time to first exacerbation actually did not achieve significance in the in the in the as needed group, um, and yet and stay in the younger patients appears to have done so. So I'm interested in my pediatric pulmonary colleagues' sense of the, this predicate data as it applies to plausibility and extrapolation. I, 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 recognizing, again, that extrapolation is a function not only of disease characteristics, of endotype issues, but also of, of available data, albeit extended to this trial. I hope my question is clear. Do we have any volunteers from our pediatric colleagues? This is Michelle Cloutier, and uh, Dr. Stoller, that is exactly uh, uh, the area that I'd like to address, and um, maybe this would help. Um, I look at the four criteria that the FDA proposed for uh, extrapolation of data to the 4 to 12-year-olds. Um, the first is that the disease is the same in adults and pediatrics. And while there are similarities 
in the disease between, uh, between uh, children and adults. There are also some significant differences um, that were not um, mentioned or discussed. And the first of these is that there's a male predominance in children uh, compared to a female predominance in adults. Some of that is related to um, structural differences and airway dyssynapsis in, uh, in boys, um, uh, which uh, re resolves as their airways grow later on. And that clearly can affect their response to a bronchodilator. The second is that the most important trigger in young children are viral respiratory tract infections, while in adults, as shown in the Mandela study, it, it was allergens uh, and exercise. And the last, which relates to response to therapy, lies in the uh, children are, young children are more likely to have a low TH2 response in early childhood as compared uh, to later on. So I think these uh, differences could in fact speak to um, the, disease, the disease not being the same in young children as it is in adults. In terms of the second element, response to treatment is the same. I think uh, all of the studies that have looked at the the addition of an ICS, now I'm talking about young children, again, 4 to 12, um, uh, the, uh, the use of the SIBRI has not shown to be uh, more effective than what they, uh, what, what we're currently recommending, which is daily ICS with Sabna Rescue. So I, 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 I'm not sure that the response, it, it doesn't look like the response is the same. And I think the TREXA data is really important because one of the things I didn't mention about TREXA is that the mean age of participants in TREXA was 10 and a half, which means they did not have very many 4 to, to 12-year-old children. They were, they were much more skewed to older children, which is one of the reasons why the expert panel did not um, support um, that therapy in young children uh, because of um, low certainty of evidence. So the third is the high confidence in the evidence, and I think you point that out beautifully. It's all over the place. And I think there are very much significant knowledge gaps, particularly in children uh, 4 to 12. And I'll leave that at, at that and say that I'll, and I'll lower my hand as well. Thank you very much. Dr. Stoller, did that, um, did that response satisfy you, or would you like to hear from other of our pediatric colleagues? Oh, no, that was very helpful. Thank, I invite other comments, but that was very helpful. Thank you. Let me ask if there are any other comments to this um, before moving on to the next um, uh, participant. Okay. Here, hearing none, um, let me um, go to Dr. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Oster. Yes. Um, I just want to make the comment in support of what we just said. One, one comment that is jumping out at me is if it's small data and now we're being asked then to extrapolate the data, why, why didn't we just get more data, right? And I think that um, for the children, uh, because um, we didn't hit a data size that was um, acceptable, does not mean um, the result is we have to extrapolate the data. So that's just my, my comment there. Great. Any, any comments on that? Great. Um, uh, Dr. Kaiser? Yes, Alex Kayser from the University of Colorado. Just a few comments on uh, some of the statistical aspects of the trial. I think it echoes a lot of what people have already raised and addressed. I think one of the challenges we have is that, and it's been stated, it's not like the study was designed to be powered in children or adolescents. And so regardless of the outcome, we would have been underpowered to probably detect a significant effect in those groups. And I think one of the things that makes it more difficult in this case is, as people have said, the 
effect estimates jump around. Um, for those adolescents, it's, you know, unexpectedly large for the higher dose group, performs better for the low dose group, and then for the children group, it, it very much looks null for the point estimate. Um, for all of these, though, as has been mentioned, the confidence intervals are extremely wide. So in a perhaps more ideal situation, you know, all of these point estimates may have appeared significant, or not significant, but aligned with the overall estimate, and we still have, though, the issue at hand that the confidence intervals would be extremely wide, potentially alluding to the chance of an effect appearing uh, with, you know, the benefit towards just the albuterol group. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges statistically here is that we really do need to lean into a lot of the context, scientific, and clinical understanding of the disease here because the study as designed was not meant to be statistically powered to address those concerns. Um, and I think really the only way to address that, I think that Ms. Oster was getting at this, is that we would need more data to confirm the effect beyond the sample size, knowing that with small numbers like this, a single person's change in the outcome can lead to very different effect estimates, um, with the caveat, again, being that there are large confidence intervals. Um, I think also just the use of the Bayesian information sharing approaches does help to illustrate what would have been needed to sort of move the needle, so to speak. And so I personally do research on these methods to develop new statistical techniques for what we call information sharing or borrowing. And one of the things to note is that one of those sort of criteria we use is what we call exchangeability, or is the effect estimate we're trying to pool together similar or not? And when we see differences in those effect estimates, as we do here, we may be wary statistically to borrow too much or read too much into pooling that data together where at one extreme we have these results now which seem very disparate and challenging to interpret, and at the other extreme we have the overall trial results which suggest benefit, and if we ignored the potential difference by age, would lead us to suggest that we should just see some benefit for the overall treatment. I mean, I know it doesn't you know, clarify what we should do, but I think it helps to illustrate that we would need to borrow a significant amount of adult data given the small sample size of both children and adolescents, but that depending on how clinically relevant we think that would be, um, it could be useful to extrapolate or incorporate that information um, in a meaningful way. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Any any additional comments to to that? Let me go on to um, Dr. May. Yes, um, I was just wondering in. Uh, it seems to me, and just following up uh, from Dr. Kaiser, that um, the data that we see for the kids are really not that supportive or are, are not only inconclusive, but they are all over the place because of the sample size. I, would, I was wondering if w there were no kids included at all. The, the disadvantage of that would have been um, to not have any information with regard to safety, but even here the safety data is limited because of the limited sample size. But would we uh, decide to go forward solely on the data of adults if we had no data for the kids whatsoever because I think besides the safety data, um, this is the comparison of that the estimates are all over and it might have been as well as not having these data at all. So I'm wondering, is there any precedent for having um, a combination drug that uh, had no data for kids but was approved for kids based on the adult data and based on the fact that it was thought to be the same disease, the same process, um, the same, uh, and for the same outcome. And that's my question. Dr. Al, yeah. this is Sally Seymour yeah. from FDA. Would you like me to respond? Yeah, that would be useful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, uh, Thank you for the question, Dr. Jones. I, um, I, in my time here at FDA, I cannot think of any example of a product that was approved, an inhalation product, based upon adult data only to include an indication in children. Um, keep in mind for extrapolation, we're generally referring to efficacy data. And so um, even if we do a full extrapolation for a PK program for a systemic product, we generally also get safety data. So there is some data in children um, beyond the adult data. Does that answer your question? Yep. Uh, just to clarify, that was Dr. May, not Dr. Jones. 
And, okay. and, and, and yes, that answers my question. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'm, this is David. I'll, I'll follow up on that, which is, you know, that was similar to the spirit of my question. I don't think anyone uh, was able to really hear because of my previous phone, which is, you know, if we're going to rely on uh, data from outside the trial results, then why are, you know, why why have included the patient population uh, to begin with? And um, it does seem like there's, um, you know, we're being asked, um, at least in my opinion, to uh, for a leap, um, you know, around what is uh, kind of existing data uh, in the heterogeneity of point effects that are that are demonstrated. So, um, so I, I appreciate that uh, comment, Dr. May. Um, are there any other follow-up points or discussion points from Dr. May's point? Um, otherwise, let's let's go to Dr. Jones. Yes, this is um, Bridget Jones. I just wanted to go back and talk a little bit more about the. Um, criteria for um, extrapolation, especially as it relates to whether or not the disease is the same in adults um, and, and children. Um, so I think, you know, most of us are aware that, you know, asthma is a, is a disease that has variable um, phenotypes. And so I think certainly that there's differences in the, the prevalence of different phenotypes um, in adults um, versus um, kids. But I think Overall, from a treatment um, standpoint, you know, if you look at the, the asthma um, national guidelines, for the most part, many of the treatments are have consistently been very similar between children and adults. And so I don't think that we have any um, biological or scientific evidence that um, drug targets um, and affected drug targets, especially for inhaled corticosteroids and short-acting short beta agonists would be um, that dissimilar between children and adults. So I, so I think based on kind of what we know and we observed over the decades, you would expect that they would behave similarly targeting, you know, um, smooth muscle um, relaxation and inflammation in children um, as well as in adults, um, even though the underlying etiologies that causing the inflammation um, may not be the same. So I just wanted to discuss that a little bit more because I think when we're thinking about the disease itself being the same versus the phenotypes um, within that disease, those are two different um, discussions. Thank you. Great. Um, um, I might ask uh, Dr. Cuvier to um, to comment because um, uh, she had kind of um, pointed out some of the differences in children uh, and adults, as well as um, making a specific comment around um, you know the guidelines did not endorse um, um, the uh, the adoption of. Um, uh, therapy for, for younger kids that were noted in the Traxxas study, I believe. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aldis and Michelle Cordier. Um, so I, I was the chair of this expert panel that um, made the 2020 focused update recommendation. And um, I, I think that the um, uh, uh, committee uh, um, in looking at these updates, and remember that it was a very it was a focused update. There were very specific questions, but there were specific questions related to intermittent ICS. And so the studies that were used. Now the results from Mandela were not available, but the studies that were used um, for this specific question were. Um, uh, were the Trexa study, uh, Terpenin study, uh, the uh, questions related to growth included uh, Camargo study from I think 2000, uh, as well as um, one other study from I think Colette, I think is the name. Um, but um, 
the whole idea behind TREXA really was to determine the, um, the, the added value of ICS plus albuterol in young children with mild asthma. And, um, and it, in terms of uh, exacerbations. And it clearly demonstrated that two things. One was that ICS plus albuterol was, did not have added value to daily ICS. Um, but, uh, and, and uh, it did not reach statistical significance when compared to albuterol alone. And that is the reason why the NAAPP guidelines do not recommend this therapy in young children. Now, there is a big difference between the NAAPP and GINA. And, and I think one of the ways that's best able to explain the reason for that is the NAAPP expert panel made a, a conscious effort not to extrapolate data across ages or asthma severity um, and to limit expert opinion. Uh, Gina um, uses e evidence when evidence is available, but also uses expert opinion um, that's informed expert opinion, I, uh, expert opinion, and does extrapolate. So that's the difference. That's one of the major reasons for the difference in this particular recommendation between the two documents. Does, does that uh, answer the question and help? Uh, I think that adds robustly to the, to the discussion. Do others have comments or? And I, and I want to thank you for that, um, for that clarification. Um, do others have comments on this point? Great. Um, let's, let's move on to Dr. Tracy. Um, Dr. Tracy? Thank you, Dr. Tracy here. This is a little bit of a follow-up. I guess I, I find myself in this incredible conundrum. And um, with data that's all over the place, in all likelihood because of small sample size. So we're, we're forced to make a decision that we almost can't make, um, or in this case, a non-decision. And, and, and we can't look at these really three fairly different groups, adults, the, the adolescents, and the kids. And, you know, my, you know, I kind of going back to the Gina versus uh, NIH guideline stuff, you know, I think expert opinion does play a role here. And, um, and I think this is a little bit of a contrary, but I mean, maybe, maybe we have to figure out some way to kind of split these out some way. My general sense is that, as, a, as I mentioned in my prior comments, I mean, these are not two, if you take in, 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 in their singular form, these are not new drugs. Um, do, they, do they affect everybody? Well, you know, what we're doing here is we're, we're kind of comparing populations where in reality, most of us who do this for a living, we, it's individuals that we take care of. And there's an awful lot of adolescents that would very much benefit from a product like this. And, and just because the sample, the powering was not sufficient to answer the question, I think it's, I'm not sure it's doing our patients a service by, by putting the kibosh on this. Um, now, on the younger kids, I mean, there's obviously less data for that. Um, and obviously, it's probably less, less clinical experience. And as far as the safety goes, which will be in the next question, you know, I think that those things are fairly well laid out. Um, I know it's a little bit different, but I think we're getting, we're getting kind of caught up here in the weeds a little bit, I think. But um, it's just my thoughts. Thank you. Great. Um, any additional comments? From the panel members. Dr. Greenberger. Uh, thank you. I want to 
just to reemphasize how important the unmet need is here. However, I'm going to say clearly that there are differences in treatment responses between adolescents and children versus adults. And the literature has enough examples of that, including quintupling fluticasone, um, as people know. So I think it might be that uh, the therapeutic differences are such of such importance with this disease asthma and heterogeneous responses are significant that extrapolation of the adult data to children is not appropriate. That's my comment. Uh, any any follow up? Um, um, Doctor Doctor uh, Dykwitz, I can I give you the opportunity to to speak? I know you raised your hand and lowered your hand, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, one of the um, issues so that I was deliberating about, uh, especially could, with could the I, comments, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you state your name uh, for the record, please? I'm sorry. Uh, so, Mark Dykwitz. So, one of the considerations that Dr. Cotier had um, raised was, of course, the distinctions in terms of reasons for exacerbations in the pediatric group and the adult group. And I'm thinking in a larger perspective here about that, in, the importance of that. And in terms of adults, um, in the particular Mandela study, was there any data that was looking at what the uh, cause of the exacerbations that did occur uh, were? Thank you. Any, any comment on that? I, I, um, my understanding, at least, and I should be corrected if, if I'm incorrect, is that the, at least in the older age groups, it seemed to be more kind of allergy, um, uh, allergic kind of uh, driven uh, versus the children. But, um, but I would welcome comment otherwise. Um, barring any other comments, um, let me uh, let me move to Dr. Hoquin. Yeah, Fernando Green, University of Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question was following or comment was following uh, Michel Cloutier. And when you say that there was no benefit from um, intermittent uh, ICS bronchodilator therapy in young children. I'm assuming you're considering the fact that maybe they are a lot less exposed to uh, when compared to daily ICS. Wouldn't that be a benefit in itself? Do you think it's equipoise in that regard? <clears throat> Thank you. So let me let me see. This is that was a that was more directed to Dr. Coutier, Is that correct? You know, it was really about the total. Uh, let me uh, let me see if I can summarize. Was that more a question about the addition of ICS? Um, well, sorry, you know, when we say when we say that there's no no benefit in that particular population, and we are using daily ICS as a comparison, the fact that you're treating kids intermittently, wouldn't that be a benefit not exposing them to daily ICS for perhaps a comparable level of control or effectiveness? I'm sorry, Dr. Hoken. I this is Michelle Coutier. I did not understand your question. I'm sorry. No, you were saying, um, Michelle, you were saying earlier that we're looking at the TREXA data that the NAHP guidelines decided not to recommend intermittent therapy in the younger kids. And I was wondering whether, you know, comparing to daily ICS, um, that was factoring sort of total ICS uh, corticosteroid exposure and its effect on, on growth. Because it seems to me that if you treat these kids with intermittent dosing, perhaps you save them from being exposed to daily ICS. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, it's a, that's a good, that's a very uh, good question, and it's an important one. Um, and the the problem is this: the data on 
growth. Um, although I, I think all of us believe that there is a clear effect of um, ICS on growth, the CAMP study demonstrated that the effect on growth uh, occurs within three months and appears to just uh, last. Um, it doesn't increase, and it appears to be about a, a sonometer. Um, uh, a little bit more in the boys, a little bit less in the girls, but are around uh, a centimeter. In, um, in Trexa, um, there was a concern about growth suppression uh, in the children who were treated with daily therapy. But that was one of the risk benefits, a known risk benefit of ICS, which is um, uh, um, but relative to, to um, growth. So um, there are, however, additional studies which don't always show that growth effect. So there is some, that was, I think, um, Carmargo's study that I, that, that I mentioned, as well as, I think, Colette's study. Um, so the data are, uh, I, I think this is one of these things in terms of guidelines where with an individual patient, you would, you would um, discuss that and use shared decision making to determine the therapy. Um, but it's, you know, we're talking about a population um, base and um, the, the difference in growth, Trapenin study did not show that difference. Um, but showed a marked difference in exacerbations in children treated daily. So, you know, there is some, there, there is some inconsistency. Um, it may be related to the actual ICS, but maybe they're specific to that. Uh, and it may also be specific to actual um, patient adherence to therapy and what they actually do use. That's the best I can do to answer that. Thank you, Dr. Tier. Appreciate it. Um, can I can I move on to uh, Dr. Kaiser? Alex Kaiser from the University of Colorado. I guess the question I think is directed more towards the FDA potentially, but it sounds like the trial originally was designed to not go down as far as four years of age. And so I'm just wondering, um, in the case like since 12 to 18 year old adolescents weren't prioritize to be powered as a comparison. Um, in the universe, you know, where we're doing the study and it was designed to be 12 plus, let's say, and we see the same effect overall that we saw here of a benefit, I guess, is it practice or like historic sort of work at the FDA that like you take that overall headline effect estimate that shows potentially benefit for the high dose, um, but then like it's underpowered for that adolescent age range. Um, would you still use that overall dose and essentially extrapolate within or, um, yeah, extrapolate, I guess, within that 12 to 17-year-old range? Um, or if the study was designed for that overall effect estimate, do you try to use that for an approval to say, even though the evidence is under power at 12 to 17, historically that's been uh, still ignored or noted in an approval of a drug? Hi, this is Dr. Seymour from FDA. Um, so historically for asthma trials, we've enrolled patients uh, 12 years of age and older, and it's generally never powered for the 12 to 18 year age group to stand on its own and be statistically significant. So we never ignore that data, but we look at that data um, and generally um, have uh, extrapolated if results are consistent, if there's no concerning um, data in that 12 to 18 year age range. There's only one instance I can think of where we had conflicting results in the 12 to 18 year age range where they actually had higher risk of exacerbations and hospitalizations where we made a decision that there was enough concerning data in the 12 to 18 year age range even though it probably wasn't powered for efficacy but there was a safety concern so we didn't approve down to 12. But generally um, speaking, the 12 to 18 year age range is included with the adults and we look at it, make sure it's consistent, supportive, and will approve for the full age range unless there's some reason not to. Thank you. That was very, very helpful.
Right. <clears throat> um, and I apologize for missing, mispronouncing your, your name, Dr. Dr. Uh, Kayser. Um, uh, Ms. Oster? I'm good. Okay, great. Ready. And, so uh, I'm fine. Okay, thank you. Um, how about Dr. Stoller? Yeah, this is Jamie Stoller. Um, I didn't want to frame my comments here. So as an adult lung doctor, I had to read Trexa for the sake of gearing up here. And, and uh, I want to make a comment and make sure it, it jives with uh, my pediatric pulmonary colleagues in response to Dr. Holguin's question. And uh, as I understood his comment, there is clear advantage to, to sparing steroid dose by using it intermittently. But when I look at Trexa and Table 2 in particular, I'm looking at it in front of me, the, the, the rescue approach of beclomethazone and albuterol actually failed, failed to achieve significance for the primary outcome measure, which was uh, um, time to first exacerbation. We were shown the data on treatment failure, which was not the primary outcome measure in the study, as I recall. So uh, while I agree with you, that, that would be a benefit. Uh, and again, extrapolation is not based on predicate data from other studies. I understand that. Uh, but the, the whole plausibility of extrapolation has to do with both the disease entity as well as ambient data. And the only data that informs beclomethazone and albuterol, as far as I, as, as I see, or the most compelling data, comes from Trexa, which, again, I uh, invite uh, dissension from my colleagues who may know this data better than I. But as I read it, looks like it, it's not consistent with rescue approach alone in the regimen that's being used here, albeit in two different inhalers, not one. So happy to be corrected on that. But I, I think it's a, a nuanced point, which, at least in my mind, has a lot to do with extrapolatability in this context. I'll stop there. Any, uh, any um let me invite dissent since Dr. Stoller uh, uh, opened that opportunity. Uh, uh, Fernando Alguin, um, University of Colorado. Thank you, Dr. Stoller. I think although being a secondary outcome, you know, failure, um, treatment failure is actually quite important because a composite, end, a composite outcome that probably included lung function symptoms and exacerbations as well. So uh, I wouldn't dismiss it as less significant. Right. Any any additional comments? I really do enjoy this robust discussion. <laughs> I'm sorry. Additional comments? Um, Dr. Holcomb, you, you had your hand up. Dr. Holcomb. I uh, know. No, I don't have my hand up. Okay. Uh, I, Great. So I, I think, I think uh, did anyone else have any other comments? I'm going to try my best to summarize this very robust discussion. And I'm going to beg the, the committee's uh, um, forgiveness, forgiveness if, I, if I miss anything. But I do invite um, additional um, correction or, or uh, nuanced um, discussion. So let me, let me try to summarize. I'm going to start with um, Dr. Tracy, who said that we are in a conundrum uh, and that there is uh, a population of patients that would uh, potentially benefit from this type of approach. And this is also echoed by others in, in the committee. Um, and that the population that, um, that we are looking at population averages as opposed to, um, you know, an individual patient uh, in front of us. At the same time, though, um, as been pointed out uh, by multiple members of the committee, there is a, a large degree of heterogeneity in the treatment effects that we have noted between uh, the adolescents as well as the uh, the children, um, you know, four to four to twelve years old, and that we're being asked to make extrapolations uh, because the data itself is so heterogeneous and actually includes unity, uh, includes one uh, in the, in the point estimates. And so then we're asked to make decisions around are 
are the diseases similar enough among children and adolescents, similar enough to adults, to make that extrapolation um, in ways that are um, robust and will serve the public interest. And so we talked uh, a lot about the similarities between um, uh, adult asthma um, and pediatric uh, asthma. I'll lump both the adolescents and children together. Uh, really mostly driving it around how we approach treatment. Um, and that the phenotypes um, uh, are different um, and that there are uh, sex differences, uh, there are trigger differences, uh, there's differences in uh, TH2 response, but that the overall effect uh, uh, is still kind of unifies around uh, a, a treatment approach. That said, uh, the supporting the, the external data that we're asked to consider in support of this application um, has some uh, issues with whether or not uh, that data actually supports the, the primary outcome that or um, that was being sought in in the in that uh, in that trial. So I mean, it, so the the sum is that. Um, I think we're faced with um, very small numbers uh, of patients in both the children and the adolescents. Uh, the the data would suggest that um, that the the reliability of the estimate has to do a lot with actually the the number of subjects, um, and that the question around extrapolation um, is is really kind of uh, predicated on the similarities between asthma as a phenotype uh, or as, you know, multiple phenotypes uh, versus the convergence on, um, uh, on uh, similar treatment approaches. Um, let, me, let me pause there and uh, ask whether or not um, I've done the discussion some justice and uh, whether or not anyone else has comments to it. Okay. If, uh, if there are no more uh, discussions or um, um, comments on the on the summary, uh, I think we can move on to question oh, no. two. Brandy oh, Oster has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not see that. Okay, that's uh, fine. I just wanted to yes, I, I just wanted to thank you for your summary, but I I do want to emphasize. Um, that we are faced with small numbers and we are faced with the reliability of the estimates that we've given and we are asked to extrapolate the data but at the end if we are wrong because the data is small because the assumptions are off um, it is the children and their growth that have to live with that and and it hasn't been made clear to me why we can't just expect larger sample sizes. Um, and so it's not um, why this is an important issue. And I can, I can feel for that mother who has that, as, as they said earlier, that point in time that, you know, you have, to, you have to solve it. But they need to understand the longer range what this can be doing. And that is our job, to put um, drugs out there that when they have the label, as what um, Dr. Piper had said, it will just be on the labeling. Um, at the point in time of having an asthma attack, no one's paying attention. So it's our job to make sure we have the data. And I, I just want to make sure that's added into your summary. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Any other, any other uh, additions? Great. Um, let's, uh, I think we can move on to question two. So question two, discuss the safety data for BDA for the proposed indication. Discuss any specific pediatric safety concerns. Um, let me, first pause 
and ask if there are any questions around uh, or comments around the concerning of how the question is worded. If there are, if there are, um, Dr. Cabana, do you have a question or concern about the wording? Sure. I, so in terms of safety concerns, I guess to clarify long-term or short-term, I guess there's no, we only have short-term data, but are, are they, are we also supposed to consider long-term safety concerns as well too? Um, can I ask the FDA uh, for um, their comment on that? Uh, yeah, this is Kelly Stone, FDA. So um, I, I think we're asking for both. You know, if this were approved, it would be used long term. And we have data, some data uh, from short term studies. Uh, but we also want to understand from the committee how you would anticipate this would be used and if there are any long-term safety concerns uh, from the new indication. D d d does that answer your question, Dr. Cabana? Yes, thanks, thanks, Dr. Stone. I just want I appreciate the clarity. Thank you. Great. Any other um, uh, questions or comments about the wording of the question? So if there are no more questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we'll now open the question to discussion. We'll start with uh, Dr. Evans. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was unmuting. Um, you know, I, I think that on balance, uh, the short-term safety data appears to be quite robust in all the areas that were tested. Um, we really see very little in terms of, of, of a safety, you know, adverse event signal. And very reassuring is that both components of this, of this combination have long-term data available. Uh, I find that, that uh, largely reassuring. Uh, the, the only concern that I, I, I'm really left with is whether we're going to uh, encounter kids who have unnecessary exposures uh, to ICS. And we've talked about this a little bit already today in, in terms of the patients who uh, maybe have uh, low uh, TH2 phenotypes. Uh, the particular concern I have or is, the, is the notion of an indication uh, where people will be using this uh, prophylactically for exercise-induced bronchospasm, whereas normally they might have only used bronchodilator. Uh, so that's, that's this principal safety concern I raise here. On the backdrop of, of a really favorable um, uh, safety profile, at least short-term, in the presented studies. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Any additional discussion on that point? Ms. Oster? Yes, this is Randy Oster, the consumer representative. Um, the two safety concerns that I want to discuss or have addressed, the first one is bone density. It's not clear to me that we understand the long-term. Um, issues of that. And the second is um, in the Mandela study from the adolescents from 12 to 18, there was only one person that was identified with a severe adverse um, event, and that was uh, anxiety and depressive disorder. And the sample size is 34. If this goes uh, much larger into the, into the, into the community, um, you know, how does that ramp up, and then what do we do about that, and, and have we addressed that adequately with this small sample size? Um, do, do, do the panels have any comments to, on, on that?
This is David, and I'll, I'll, I'll come in. I mean, I think it's the same challenge that we have around the efficacy data, uh, which is that the low numbers do not allow us to really talk with confidence about whether or not there is a, um, a high degree of certainty. Um, I, do, um, I do agree with Dr. Evans that, um, uh, that the, as individual components, we have had a long history of, um, of this, uh, of these two um, compounds, but the uh, the combination and how they might use and how they might accumulate, um, I, I don't think is fully is fully known. Um, but I'd, be, I'd welcome comments from others along that line. Otherwise, let's. Um, I'm happy to move on. Uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Jones. Uh, yes, um, I, I think, you know, as was previously mentioned, you know, the short-term safety data I think is reassuring, but the real question is exposure and how it will be actually used in, in the real world. Um, the, the overall dosing regimen um, and proposed indication is, is pretty broad. Um, you know, it's indicated for advocate or prevention of bronchoconstriction. So when I think about prevention of bronchoconstriction, I think specifically about children using it prior um, to, to exercise um, and exertion. I, I agree um, with others in being concerned about um, children being exposed to inhaled corticosteroids um, at, at times that they really don't need to have that um, as a treatment. Um, so. Um, I, I do think certainly there would be need for, for long-term safety follow-up, but just the broadness of the dosing regimen and the indication, um, you know, does, does give me some concern about the um, long-term exposure. All right. Um, no additional comments. Uh, Dr. Greenberger? Thank you. This is to follow up on Randy's question about anxiety. Uh, uh, Undertreated uh, asthma. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to inter interrupt you. Um, could you please state your name for the record? I'm sorry. Paul Greenberger. Thank Can you. you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. Undertreated asthma causes, you know, burden on families and, and certainly children and adolescents. So the the lack of a quick fix or, you know, a good product to intervene to control and delay the time of the exacerbation or prevent the exacerbation is extremely important. So I, that in itself causes anxiety. So I look at that, I look at the, the numbers of anxiety identified here as, uh, that needs to be compared with, with um, probably the, the alternative, which is not a, you know, some investigational product like treatment, for example. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about that number in itself. Right. Um, uh, Dr. Kim? Hi, I have um, uh, Edwin Kim, University of North Carolina. I guess I have more of a comment than a question. Um, it's been brought up a few times. These are two uh, medications that are well-known, um, and we understand the risks of them. And I think one piece that's reassuring to me is, although it's short-term data, there's not, it doesn't seem that there's any indication of new adverse events that we did not predict or did not know. And so in some ways, I do think that uh, we, we can and should give some level of credit to the prescribers who have been using these medications for long periods of time uh, and have, oh, you know, I think some sense of how to manage it. Uh, again, some guidelines around, I think, the pretreatment, as, as has been discussed, would seem to be very important to manage sort of ICS cumulative dose. Uh, but for me, at least not seeing or having any indication of some unexpected or some new adverse event from the combination is, is reassuring. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Schwartzop?
Uh, this is Jennifer Schwartz, and I'm the patient representative. Uh, I'd like to give the patient perspective. As a lifelong asthma patient, I understand the unmet need and the limitations of albuterol on its own. I was uncontrolled for years and years, and it's a very, very scary situation, especially when you're a child. Um, I go back all the way till I can't remember when. <laughs> So um, personally, I've learned um, how not to breathe. As an adult, I sometimes couldn't afford the multiple inhalers, and even recently I've had to fight my, my insurance company to cover my Zopinex, Solera, and the nebulizer treatments, and the meds don't always help anyway. So you just learn how to deal without some of these things. I do believe we need this in the arsenal as an option for many people. Um, I do understand that this drug is something that will change lives, but I also understand the concerns that the data is all over the place and that the small data groups um, are concerning. But I am leaning towards deciding to move forward with the adult benefits outweighing the risks. Adults have conform, informed consent and can decide if this is their, an option for them or if they want to go another route. I, um, the middle adolescent group, um, I'm having some problems making a decision. There is a lack of data, but the benefits very possibly outweigh the risks. I'm not an expert to understand all the data. But as an adult with loved ones with asthma, I feel that with medical and parental supervision and future follow-up with the FDA, it is worthwhile and safe to proceed with the treatment for the adolescents. As for the pediatric group, I don't think there's enough data. Um, we do not have an infor enough information to make an informed decision to approve it, and this age group is too much at risk. Uh, more data is needed to prove the safety. And as much as I feel for the children and the doctors and the parents, I just don't feel we can move forward with that group. Um, although I think further study is warranted. That's my what I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Schwarzkopf. Um, Dr. Hoquin? Yeah, Fernando Jim. I know there's some concerns about long-term ICS exposure. I just want to highlight that in the Mandela study, the pattern of utilization was in kids was similar to adults, and the majority of kids used, uh, I think the average was like two inhalations per day. Uh, and in fact, I think 30 to 40% did not use at all um, inhalers. So I think I'm not that concerned about long-term ICS accumulation with this, method, with this approach. Great. Right. Um, are there are there any point other um, points that people would want would like to make? All right. Let me let me see if I can summarize this um, this discussion. the The question that we are asked um, is is really to discuss the safety data for BDA for the proposed indication and discuss any specific pediatric safety concerns. And I think most of our discussion focused on that. Uh, I think the discussion focused both on short-term as well as long-term um, uh, safety concerns. Um, overall, I, I would say that I think I heard consensus that the um, that these are two known substances uh, that have been used separately for a long period of time and that there was general um, relief that there was no new adverse events um, or unexpected adverse events that uh, would occur. Um, that the, that there are, that there were issues um, uh, specifically around long-term uh, bone density, um, as well as, as the one SAE that occurred uh, due to anxiety and depression. Um, although it was pointed out that um, that the under treatment of asthma also produces a fair amount of anxiety um, 
uh, and concern both for the patient as well as the uh, the family. Um, the there, I think there was also um, uh, consensus around um, the desire not to expose children to uh, excessive amounts of inhaled corticosteroids. Although the data from the trial would suggest that um, that the average dose was would would not be um, all that different, or people did not have uh, at least some of the panel members did not have concern around um, excessive doses of um, uh, inhaled corticosteroids, at least in, in the, over the short short run, and um, um, I, I do think that there is also consensus around that the number of, and this is a really conversation uh, focused more on adolescents and children, which is that the numbers were really inadequate to uh, to determine whether or not um, there was any true safety signal. Um, just because the event rate was relatively low, and um, and the numbers uh, in the overall population of those two groups were were small. So um, let me um, let me pause and ask if there are any additional questions. And Dr. Evans, your hand is up, and I don't know if you um, uh, wanted to add something uh, before um, this, uh, or whether or not it was just errant. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, great. Um, can I ask for um, committee comment on my summary? Did I did I miss anything uh, um, of substance? Right. Um, if there's no uh, further discussion on this question, uh, we'll now take a quick 15-minute break, um, about 15-minute break, how about that? Um, uh, panel members, please remember that there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during the break. Uh, why don't we reconvene at uh, 3.10 Eastern Time? So a little bit more than 15 minutes from now. Okay? Thank you all. It's been a great discussion so far.
just to give everyone a heads up, we have one minute. Welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> uh, we will now move on to the next question, uh, which is a voting question. Takiya Stevenson will provide the instructions for the voting. Questions three through five are voting questions. Voting members will use the Adobe Connect platform to submit their votes for this meeting. After the chairperson has read the voting question into the record and all questions and discussion regarding the wording of the vote question are complete, the chairperson will announce that voting will begin. If you are a voting member, you will be moved to a breakout room. A new display will appear where you can submit your vote. There will be no discussion in the breakout room. You should select the radio button that is the round circular button in the window that corresponds to your vote, yes, no, or abstain. You should not leave the no vote choice selected. Please note that you do not need to submit or send your vote. Again, you need only to select the radio button that corresponds to your vote. You will have the opportunity to change your vote until the vote is announced as closed. Once all voting members have selected their vote, I will announce that the vote is closed. Next, the vote results will be displayed on the screen. I will read the vote results from the screen into the record. Thereafter, the chairperson will go down the roster and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why you voted as you did if you want to. However, you should also address any subparts of the voting question, if any. Are there any questions about the voting process before we begin? Are there, um, do, so let me read question number three, which is a voting question. Do the data support a favorable benefit risk assessment for use of BDA in patients equal to or greater than 18 years of age with asthma? If not, what additional data are needed? Are there any issues or questions about the wording of the voting question? If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now begin voting on question three. We will now move voting members to the voting breakout room to vote only. There will be no discussion in the voting breakout room.
Voting has closed and is now complete. Once the vote results display, I will read the vote results into the record. The vote results are displayed. I will read the vote totals into the record. The chairperson will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why you voted as you did if you want to. However, you should also address any subparts of the voting question, if any. There are 16 yeses, one no, zero abstentions. Thank you. We will, know, we will now go down the list and have everyone who voted state their name and vote into the record. Uh, you may provide justification of your vote if you wish to. We'll start uh, with um, Alex uh, Kayser. Alex Kayser, yes. Dr. Jones? Bridget Jones, I voted yes. Mm. Uh, David O, I voted yes. Dr. Kim? Edwin Kim, University of North Carolina, yes. Dr. Hope Queen? Fernando Guillen voted yes. Dr. Stoller? Jamie Stoller, I, I voted yes. Dr. Tracy? Dr. James Tracy, I voted yes. Ms. Schwarzkopf? Schwartzoff? Jennifer Schwartzad, I voted yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dykwitz? Dyk Dr. Dykwitz, yes. Dr. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, Cataletto? Mary Cataletto, I voted yes. Apologies. Uh, Dr. Cabana? Michael Cabana, I voted yes. Dr. Cloutier? Michelle Cloutier, I vote yes. Uh, Dr. Greenberger? Paul Greenberger, I voted yes. Uh, Ms. Oster? This is Randy Oster, consumer representative. I voted no. I voted no for the reason that I wanted to emphasize the need for analysis of triggers, which was not included in the study as Dr. Piper um, talked about, as well as at the age of 18, there's still growth for young uh, men especially, and that the growth, there was no formal growth study. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Huntsberger? Yes, Sal Huntsberger. I voted yes. Uh, I thought the efficacy data were strong and there are no safety signals. So I, I thought for this population, I voted yes. Dr. Evans? This is Scott Evans. I voted yes uh, for the reasons just stated by Dr. Huntsberger. And Dr. May? Suzanne May, I voted yes, uh, ditto with regards to the reasons asked Dr. Hansberger. Um, thank you very much, and I apologize for my coughing fit. Um, the, um, the consensus, you know, by a large majority uh, was, was favorable mainly because I think in this older age group that there was a, a robust um, uh, efficacy signal and, um, and that the overall, um, there were minimal safety concerns, although uh, to acknowledge uh, Ms. Oster and her uh, dissent around uh, safety signal uh, for uh, growing um, 
young men as well as um, uh, triggering events. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to question number four, also a voting question. Do the data support a favorable benefit risk assessment for use of BDA in patients uh, greater than the age of, I'm sorry, yeah, greater than the age of 12, greater than or equal to 12, to less than 18 years of age with asthma? If not, what additional data are needed? Are there any issues or questions about the wording of the voting question? This is, Ma this is Michelle Cloutier. Is this asthma of all severities, or is it specific? Can I ask the FDA to clarify, please? Uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, Kelly Stone, FDA. So um, the indication doesn't specify severity, so uh, it's without distinction of severity. It, it, it's in line with the proposed indication. And when after the vote, if there are concerns about severity, uh, comments can be made to uh, clarify your vote. If there are no more questions uh, or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now begin voting on question number four. We will now move voting members to the voting breakout room to vote only. There will be no discussion in the voting breakout room.
Sorting has closed and is now complete. Once the vote results display, I will read the vote results into the record. The vote results are displayed. I will read the vote totals into the record. The chairperson will go down a list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why you voted as you did if you want to. However, you should also address any subparts of the voting question, if any. There are eight yeses, nine noes, zero abstentions. Thank you. We will now go down the list and have everyone who voted state their name and vote into the record. You may also provide justification of your vote if you wish to. We'll start with Dr. Uh, Kayser. Alex Kayser and I voted no. Um, the reason I voted no was that there was enough heterogeneity in the data presented and potentially with past um, studies that made it challenging to be highly confident that we could extrapolate these results. And I think essentially what would be help drive a confidence in extrapolation is just more data or more observation um, to further identify that the effect sizes align with the adult population as we would hypothesize and to give more confidence that potentially long-term safety outcomes as well could be followed up further. Dr. Jones? This is Bridget Jones, um, and I voted yes. Um, I voted yes um, that there is a favorable benefit risk risk assessment um, due to the reassuring um, short-term safety data that was presented um, in the study, and no major safety signals were um, identified. Um, I think based on um, the the concepts of extrapolation um, in a disease like asthma, which is um, similar, although there's varying phenotypes in both children um, and adults, um, I do think that um, full extrapolation is appropriate in this age group and that you would expect um, similar outcomes um, for a favorable risk benefit as in, as in adults. Um, I do think there's a need for um, more long-term safety data to determine um, overall exposure, long-term frequency um, of use, um, and I also think there needs to be further consideration around the specific um, parameters for, for uh, approval as far as how the medication is, is being used and in what um, emphasis it's being used in asthma, for example, in exercise-induced um, asthma. Thank you. Um, David O, I voted no. <clears throat> I voted no because um, similar reasons to what Dr. Kayser had mentioned, uh, especially around the lack of directness in terms of uh, the um, inferences from any uh, particular point estimate. I, I, would, I would say that I would give deference to the, um, the, to the FDA to make decisions around this particular age group um, so that it aligns with um, what has been done in the, in the past as well so as not to create, um, you know, more confusion in, in the practicing field around whether or not, um, um, you know, a, a, a particular drug or a set of drugs is indicated for, the, for adolescents in particular. Uh, but in terms of the data itself, I do not think it supported um, um, uh, a favorable uh, benefit risk just on, the, on face. So thank you. Um, Dr. Kim? Edwin Kim, I voted no. Uh, the risks, I think, are known and mostly manageable. However, the benefits to me were unclear. 
even if one assumed the benefit were there from extrapolation, the correct dose, I think, was also unclear. And so for those reasons, I think I couldn't, I couldn't support a benefit over the known risk. Uh, and I just, I would need a larger sample size with more clear efficacy, including supporting the, uh, the higher dose regimen. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hawking? Uh, Fernando Guin, I voted yes for the reasons outlined by Dr. Jones. Right. Uh, Dr. Stoller? Yeah, this is Jamie Stoller. I voted no. Um, you know, my, my usual want is to sort of frame the level of confidence in my vote, and I would say in this particular issue it was at most moderate. What I, what I, what I mean by that is that uh, I have no particular safety concerns in this particular population. Um, my, my concern regarded the, uh, the possibility of extrapolation, as has been said. Uh, extrapolation, in, as I intimated, regards the similarity of disease and then the applicability of predicate data, in this case from, from TRECTA, and both from the fact, as was pointed out, that the, the point estimate, uh, admittedly small sample sizes, the point estimates in this study were in the wrong direction for the dose that's being proposed. Again, uh, tiny numbers, very volatile. Uh, and uh, at least from Trexin, the primary outcome measure, the, the data were not supportive of a budesonide uh, albuterol rescue combination. So those are the reasons that I voted no. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Tracy? Uh, James Tracy here. I voted yes. Um, I do believe that it was reasonable, as, the, uh, as, as members from the agency pointed out, that it's often Adolescent data is pooled with the thoughts. I was I was reassured by that. From a safety standpoint, I saw no significant safety signals whatsoever. And as I mentioned in the past, this this the primary drug of concern, of course, is the budesonide, and that's in already indicated down at age 12 months. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Schwartzot. Yes, I'm Jennifer Schwartzot, and I voted yes. I feel that the benefits do outweigh the risks, although there are some risks. Um, I do also think that further long-term data collection needs to be done um, from the FDA um, for youth under the age of 18. But I felt that it, there was enough there to put it through. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dykowitz? Uh, Mark Dykwitz, I voted um, yes, which was, if you will, a, a weak confidence yes. Considerations that went into my mind, uh, well, certainly the data is inconclusive. I did extrapolate, give some credit, if you will, to the data that has been generated within this age group for um, budesonide for Motorol, which has shown uh, benefit for reducing, um, uh, well, having an effect on rescue. Um, I, I think that gives me some level of confidence that within this age group, we are looking at a disease process that would respond to an inhaled corticosteroid um, beta agonist combo. Uh, I would also, though, say, uh, based upon uh, a question that I had raised earlier in the discussion, that I do have some um, uncertainty about whether or not we can extrapolate fully from the formoterol data. Formoterol is a long-acting beta agonist. And it is possible that that data is being driven in a positive way, uh, not only by the inhaled corticosteroid, but also by the long-acting beta agonist uh, uh, nature of the drug. Um, this is also a population, adolescents, that is at higher risk uh, for exacerbation and uh, morbidity. Uh, there is certainly the deliberation about what the correct dose would be, uh, where we had uh, the 80 dose uh, looking somewhat more favorable. Um, but I also am giving some deference to the FDA precedent for grouping together age 12 uh, and 18 with the adult patients. Uh, thank you. 
Great. Uh, thank you. Um, can I ask the uh, committee members, if you're not speaking, to place yourself on mute? Um, we would appreciate that. Um, Mary uh, Cataletto. Mary Cataletto, I voted yes. Um, I think the risk benefits um, pretty much speak for themselves. However, I would make one exception, having worked with this population basically my whole career. Um, it has the potential for abuse, and I think that um, it requires a whole new education for kids who, if they're going to use this BDA the way they use albuterol as premedication for exercise, there is the potential that they're going to abuse it. Um, so I would be very careful with that, even though I said yes. Um, I think that the exercise-induced asthma section needs to be very carefully crafted and followed. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cabana? Michael Cabana, I voted no. I voted no for the reasons already articulated by Dr. Kayser and Dr. Kim. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cloutier? This is Michelle Cloutier. I voted no for the reasons better articulated by um, Dr. O and Dr. Kim uh, than I could uh, articulate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Greenberger? Paul Greenberger, I voted no. I do not believe that the evidence supports favorable benefit in terms of the benefit risk assessment. I have no concerns regarding risks, but I do not see supportive benefit, and that's why I voted no. I would like to see the agency and the sponsor work together to solve this problem and find if there are good responders in this age range. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Oster? This is Randy Oster, consumer representative, and I voted no. I'd like to expand the thoughts of my other colleagues and say that I voted no because the exasperations by, um, that cause asthma are caused by irritants, and there is secondary data that says that zip codes are, an, are a point um, where highways and factories can be a leading indicator. We have here a wonderful solution that could work, but also could impact the growth rate of this particular age group. And we have small data, and that data was not balanced by demographic. So therefore, I would challenge the FDA as we move forward to really look at um, sometimes upstream thinking and make sure that we have a demographic balance um, in in the data that is presented. Thank you. Dr. Hunsberger? Yes, Sally Hunsberger. My yes is a very, very soft yes. Um, and I think the, the main reason I voted yes was just the, the idea that in the past the FDA has extrapolated from the adults to the, this age group. Um, the, the, the data in the study clearly don't uh, give us any information about efficacy. So it is purely based on, the, on the, um, the extrapolation and just because the FDA has done that in the past. So if the FDA uh, ruled differently, I, I would not be opposed to that. But I think that was my main consideration. Um, the short-term safety, I think, is appropriate. Um, again, we don't know the long-term safety. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Evans? Yes, hi, this is Scott Evans. I voted yes. I, I did so on the basis of a generally favorable safety profile with a robust overall efficacy signal and some hint, at least, of a signal in this particular population. Uh, and the fact that I think it's mechanistically reasonable to extrapolate that efficacy signal to this population. Um, I do wish to emphasize, though, in my comments, uh, as I did earlier, my concern about uh, using this strategy for exercise-induced asthma. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. May? Suzanne May, I voted no. Um, the confidence intervals for the effect estimates for the indications that I've 
thought. We're stretching from about a half in the positive direction to about two and a half to four in the harmful direction, which is to me consistent with uh, as, or as supportive as no data. And approving may set a precedent for other combination drugs with no data for children with similar individual safety profile in adults and uh, children and combined efficacy data in adults. If the FDA were to consider seeing that as a precedent because of um, the strength of the adult data, then I could understand that. But otherwise, I think there is not sufficient data in the kids to support a positive benefit to risk ratio um, on the primary outcome for the indication sought. And that was it. Thank you very much. So we, we definitely had a divided vote. <laughs> Again, apologies for my, my voice. Um, along the yeses uh, was really a theme of the ability to extrapolate um, data from not only um, the, the compounds being under consideration, but other studies outside of it that support the, the general consideration of, of um, you know, this combination um, for this particular age group. Um, there, there were some uh, voices around the softness around the yes, um, mainly around um, the idea that um, there had been some precedent uh, from the agency before about um, not looking at this particular age sub subgroup. Um, and making decisions, um, you know, independent of of, um, independent, uh, of studies um, that included uh, data specifically uh, targeting this group or, or studies, you know, uh, targeted at this subgroup. Um, I think overall, the um, there was um, general um, recognition that there was reasonable safety data uh, again based on extrapolation. Um, but that there were um, some issues, um, including making sure that there was no abuse of this approach, uh, and there was uh, a number of comments around exercise-induced asthma or exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So, in terms of the no's, um, there was, uh, I think, a clear um, message around uh, lack of confidence um, in the um, in the data and lack of consistency in terms of dose response relationships and not being able to actually estimate what is the right uh, dosage. The, the committee, I think, uh, differed from some of the yeses in that the uh, external data uh, did not necessarily support the uh, the use of this combination uh, in, in this uh, approach. Um, the um, and then um, also in the nose, there was an ask for the FDA uh, to uh, to look at um, the uh, to ensure that there is demographic uh, data collection um, um, in in future studies. I think um, within the nos and the yeses, there was a general theme of that there is more data that's needed. Uh, within this particular population uh, in age categories, um, and that the data itself was um, not uh, directly, um, could not directly speak um, uh, just because of the, the relatively few number of um, adolescents that were included in the study. Um, so let me pause there and ask if, uh, if I missed anything from the committee or whether or not you feel like I've summed that up adequately. Great. Um, we will now move on to uh, question five, also a voting question. Do the data support a favorable benefit risk assessment for the use of BDA in patients um, equal to or greater than four years uh, to 12 years, less than 12 years of age with asthma? Uh, if not, what additional data are needed?
Are there any issues or questions about the wording of the voting question? If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now begin voting on question five. We will now move voting members to the voting breakout room to vote only. There will be no discussion in a voting breakout room. Voting has closed and is now complete. Once the vote results display, I will read the vote results into the record. The vote results are displayed. I will read the vote totals into the record. The chairperson will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why you voted as you did if you want to. However, you should also address any subparts of the voting question, if any. There is one yes, 16 no's, zero abstentions. Thank you. We will now go down the list and have everyone who voted state their name and vote into the record. You may also provide justification of your vote if you wish to. We will start with Dr. Um, Kayser. Alex Kayser and I voted no. I think the reasons are similar to my uh, reasons for the uh, 12 to 17 year old range in that Given the small sample sizes, there's just a lot of uncertainty around the point estimate. And given that it was very much in the neighborhood of the null, um, around a hazard ratio of one, I think additional data is needed to either confirm that even though there is a fairly good short-term safety profile, is it truly a lack of efficacy or is it just that it's a small sample and more data is needed to actually confirm that there may be a benefit there um, for at least some patients given the potential heterogeneity across phenotypes that others mentioned. I further think as well that 
long-term safety data may be needed with regards to some of the growth concerns or considerations that were also raised by other committee members. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jones? This is Brenda Jones. Um, I voted yes um, in part to my comment for the other um, age groups. Again, I think the overall safety profile was reassuring with no um, concerning um, safety events. I also, um, you know, think about the fact that, you know, the original discussions and proposal with the FDA was to assess safety. Um, and, you know, I, I applaud the FDA and the sponsors' efforts to um, obtain efficacy data in children, um, in young children especially, um, but I think, you know, it's certainly limited by the very small sample size and then um, likely the um, um, maybe not the most appropriate primary outcome endpoint um, of exacerbation. So I think based off of that, um, we're left with whether or not, you know, you can extrapolate based on disease sim similarities and what we know about these medications and, and how they um, um, function in, in children. And so based off of those thoughts of um, utilizing extrapolation, um, I still think there's kids in the 4 to 12 age group who would likely benefit um, from this medication. And I think, um, you know, our, our job is to kind of make that educated guess. And then the art of medicine occurs in the doctor's office where we determine um, which children um, may benefit um, from, from use of, of certain medications. So for those reasons, um, I voted yes. I, I still think there's a concern for the long-term safety, as I mentioned before. So there would definitely need to be post-marketing safety studies and then additional um, look at um, more specific parameters um, of use, um, particularly related to um, exercise-induced asthma. Great. Um, <clears throat> this is David O. I voted no um, for the same reasons as Dr. Kayser. Thank you. Dr. Kim? Edwin Kim, I voted no. Uh, similar to my argument with the adolescents, I think the risk again here is known and mostly manageable. Uh, but I think the data, uh, the, uh, the efficacy data at the dose studied is inconclusive. And um, extrapolation, I have some concerns, as was voiced during the discussion about some of the differences uh, in the youngest uh, asthmatics versus the adults and the different triggers. Uh, additional you. studies would just be um, additional efficacy studies specific to this age group uh, to show that um, there is some stronger signal than what has been shown so far that could justify further extrapolation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hoffman? Yeah, Fernando Jean, I voted no um, for the reasons that Dr. Kaiser mentioned, but in addition to me, it was important the fact that there's less um, evidence supporting efficacy um, in other studies outside the trial as well. Thank you. Um, let's see, Dr. Stoller? Uh, this, is, <coughs> this is Dr. Stoller. I voted. <coughs> Uh, I think the reasons have been nicely articulated. I would emphasize the need for a dedicated study uh, to get real-world data on use and long-term effects in this young population. I'll stop there. Thank you. Dr. Tracy. Thank you. Um, excuse me. This is Takiya speaking. I'm sorry to interrupt. Dr. Stoller, I'm sorry. Uh, well, just a general friendly reminder to all um, participants, please remember to mute your your phones or your um, in Adobe or on your phones when you are not speaking. Dr. Stoller, could you please kindly re repeat your name and your vote? I'm not sure if we caught the um, when you um, stated your vote into the record. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm, I was unmuted. Yes, it was just back. It was just background noise coming from someone else. So yeah, please just um, restate your name and your vote for the record. This is Jamie Stoller. Uh, I voted no largely for the reasons stated, and I would emphasize the need for a, long, a larger study in this particular population to better ascertain long-term risks in real-world data. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dr. Stoller. I can hand it back to the, to the chair. Thank you, Dr. Al. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tracy? Uh, Dr. Tra James Tracy, I voted no. Um, Although I had no real concerns from a safety standpoint, 
where I felt like we could extrapolate with adolescents, I didn't think that would hold quite so true with this age group. Thank you. Ms. Schwartzot. This is Jennifer Schwartzot, and I voted no. I just do not feel like there was enough data to make a truly informed decision on safety and efficacy, along with the other reasons others have stated. Thank you. Dr. Dykowitz? Mark Dykowitz, no, uh, for the reasons uh, well articulated by others. Thank you. Dr. Cataletto? Mary Cataletto, I voted no for the reasons that have been expressed so far. Thank you. Dr. Cabana? Michael Cabana, I voted no, similar to the reasons stated by Dr. Stoller. Thank you. Dr. Coutier? I voted no. I think there are too many uncertainties related to the efficacy, and I think it's unclear how to use um, this uh, combination in children, uh, in young children, especially in asthma of different severities, as well as different in, um, indications, including exercise-induced asthma. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Cloutier, can I ask you to state your name to the record? Oh, I'm, I, I'm sorry, it's Michelle Cloutier, and I voted no uh, for the Thank reasons you. articulated by others. Thank you. I think we got your reasons. I, did. I think we just needed your official name. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Greenberger? Paul Greenberger, I voted no. Uh, as with adolescents in the ages 4 to 12, I do not believe we have evidence of a favorable benefit, and I voted no for that reason. Thank you. Ms. Oster? This is Randy Oster, consumer representative and I voted no, and I wish I didn't have to. I remember what Michelle Dinkins said about it was a simple and elegant relief. Dr. Seymour called it novel, and it was uh, Kelly Stone referred to it as unique, and what an opportunity if we could have approved this. But I want to go back and make sure that um, for us to do that, that the message is clear, small data actually slows down the process because we weren't able to say yes today. And from a consumer point of view, when people think of the FDA, they think that it's safe and tested and that that's what we have to deliver so that there is trust. And so going forward, I hope that this message is, um, is a, an opportunity for when the testing samples are coming in for, to push back and say we need more because we know where this is going to go at the end of the results. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Huntsberger? Uh, Sally Huntsberger, I voted no. Um, I believe you can't extrapolate um, from the adult data to this sub small subgroup. Um, I think we need efficacy data, you need long-term safety data, and also learn more about how it would be used in this population. So for those reasons, I voted no. Um, thank you. Dr. Evans? Uh, this is Scott Evans, and I voted no. Um, the reasons have largely already been stated, but I will also emphasize that I'm sympathetic uh, to Dr. Jones' comments about the art of medicine. And in this case, uh, since both components of this combination are already uh, approved for use in this population, um, I regard physicians that are caring for these patients still have the opportunity uh, to prescribe them if they perceive their patient to have a, a potential benefit. Right. Dr. May? Suzanne May, I voted no for the reasons stated by others on the committee and for the reasons stated for the last question as well. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can summarize this for us. Um, there was a overwhelming um, preponderance of no votes in this case. The yes vote um, was made largely um, because of, I think, largely because of the art of medicine and that the uh, safety profiles of the known agents 
are well described and can be and can be managed. That uh, the ability to extrapolate based on existing data um, was appropriate, and um, and therefore um, the panel member felt that it was appropriate to uh, recommend approval. I think the no um, the no votes come down to um, a disagreement around uh, the ability to extrapolate. Uh, the, the lack of consistent efficacy data, uh, data that is inconsistent internally um, around uh, dose and dose response relationships. Um, there was also um, uh, an absence of uh, long-term uh, safety data, uh, as well as desire um, to have a better understanding of how this would be used in, in the real world. Uh, finally, um, there was a comment around uh, small data or small uh, numbers of patients and, and how it slows um, the approval processes and is, is relatively uh, inefficient. Um, so uh, as well as the need for um, obviously additional uh, data within uh, this, this particular age stratum. Let me let me pause there and ask if there is anything that I missed in summary that people feel like they should add. Hearing hearing none, uh, I think we are close to adjournment. But before we adjourn, are there any last comments from the FDA? Hey, this is Kelly Stone from the FDA. So on, on behalf of the division and the agency, I would like to thank the committee uh, for um, uh, your, your comments, your feedback. Um, we're going to take all of the information that you provided uh, in your discussion uh, as we review this program. But uh, uh, we're, we're grateful to you for your um, uh, efforts in reviewing the program and, and providing insight. So thank you, uh, thank you all, uh, to all participants. So um, I also wanted to thank the panel members. I thought the discussion was very robust. I also appreciate AstraZeneca and Bonda for um, uh, for their uh, presentations today. Um, and I just want to um, uh, wish everyone um, a pleasant evening, and uh, we will now adjourn the meeting. Thank you. The meeting is now open.